Chair, I'm calling to order this um, hearing. This is a joint hearing of the Committee of the Whole and the Committee on Education. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council, Chair of the Committee of the Whole, and uh, David Catania, Council Member at Large, is Chair of the Committee on Education. Uh, the topic of this joint public hearing is truancy reduction in the D.C. public school system. Uh, today is Thursday, February 28, 2013. The time is 2.37 in the afternoon. We are in room 123 of the John A. Wilson building. Uh, as I, I gave the topic of this hearing, the purpose of this public oversight hearing is to hear testimony regarding the progress of D.C. public school system and supporting agencies in responding to the problem of truancy and to ascertain what the government ought to do to reduce truancy. Experience shows that many of the district students with high rates of truancy will never finish school and as a result will most likely struggle to be productive adults. A similar hearing was held uh, by the Committee of the Whole and I believe it was a joint hearing with the Committee on Judiciary at that time on July 12th and November 8th of last year. And these committees, that's Committee of the Whole and Committee on Education, will continue to hold these oversight hearings. Uh, even though truancy is not exclusive to DCPS, this hearing today will focus on efforts regarding the DCPS students. Uh, for this hearing, uh, we've limited the witness list to government agencies. We had a hearing not really on the topic, but on legislation related to the topic a couple of weeks ago. And as I said, we will um, have additional hearings on this topic. So uh, because there are other opportunities for uh, citizens to testify, today's hearing is limited to government witnesses. It is our practice, or my practice, to swear in government witnesses, and that's what we will do. Uh, and I'm going to ask um, the witnesses to come forward one at a time when we get to them. Uh, I'm going to turn to um, my colleague and co-chair of this hearing, Mr. Catania, and then we've also been joined by a couple other members of the council for um, opening statements, if there are any. Mr. Catania. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been looking forward to this hearing. It, it uh, as you mentioned, uh, follows upon a hearing we had just two weeks ago on, a, on obviously a, the same subject. Um, this is, however, more of an update on our efforts uh, that we have started a few years ago. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, not only in your capacity as chairman, but prior capacity as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee for having such a focus on truancy. Uh, I believe that this is one of the biggest barriers to improved uh, results within the district public school system, both the traditional and the truant and the, and the uh, charter school system. Uh, children, quite simply, Mr. Chairman, have to be in school in order to learn. Uh, I'm pleased that the that the focus and attention that uh, the council has provided to this subject, working in partnership with D.C. Public Schools and the office of the mayor, that we have begun to a very serious dialogue, not just around celebrating the issue but around finding constructive solutions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, by way of background, uh, many individuals who are uh, at this dais and in the room were at our hearing a couple of weeks ago on the subject of the bill that, that uh, the Council uh, introduced. Uh, there are many of us, uh, five of us I believe, who co-authored and a good number of others who co-sponsored uh, that looked to uh, right-size, if you will, the consequences for truancy and, and chronic truancy in the city. I think we're moving very close to a solution with the executive, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chairman. Now, let me briefly outline some of the ideas of common ground. Uh, again, I don't want to speak too soon because these these items can always be revised and changed, and they are subject to both. Uh, it looks like there is universal agreement that uh, the present policy of waiting until a child uh, older than the age of 14 has missed 25 days of school. Uh, before there is a referral to court social services for action up to and including a child in need of supervision proceeding. I believe there's a common agreement, at least between me and the Attorney General, that 25 days is too long. That after a child has been out of school for 25 days, from 14 to 17, the invitations to mischief are abundant, the child's education is irreversibly, irre irre irreversibly harmed, uh, and uh, the, the opportunity to put, put the child back on track is diminished. So uh, there is an agreement, um, again, subject to change, that we will change that from 25 days to 15 days. So in other words, once a child 14 to 17 has missed 15 days, there can be a referral to court social services. 
This is not a criminal proceeding. It is a child in need of supervision proceeding where the court can insert itself to try to remedy whatever the issues are that keep the child out of school. So I believe that to be an improvement. Uh, there's also um, an understanding and agreement that after 10 unexcused absences, uh, presently children 5 to 13, uh, we refer to CFSA, and I believe the evidence I've seen anecdotally shows that that is working. Uh, but in addition, we will look to inform the parent that at 10 absences that they are at risk of prosecution by a letter from the Metropolitan Police Department to the parent or guardian. This was a practice that we used to do many years ago, and it had the, uh, it had the effect of inspiring parents and guardians to show up at the school and to take responsibility for their children's actions. Uh, we've also agreed, Mr. Chairman, that at 15 days, uh, because there will be a referral, uh, if, if this legislation is successful, to court social services, that in conjunction with that, the Attorney General himself will send out a letter at the 15th day of unexcused absences informing the parents of that referral and the increased likelihood of prosecution under the existing law, which has been on the books for several decades, uh, involving uh, educational uh, uh, um, com the compulsory education statute in the district, which today, irrespective of what we do, uh, makes it a misdemeanor for a child to miss two unexcused or have two unexcused absences in a month. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what remains to be worked out, uh, and, I, and of course I want to acknowledge my colleague, Mr. Grasso, for his advocacy on behalf of in-school suspension. Uh, I, I, I intend for that to be a part of what we bring to the full council, as, as well as issues of, of attendance centers. Uh, and uh, the issue, Mr. Chairman, and let me uh, end by saying the issue is, you know, what happens in terms of a social services referral at the 10th day uh, of unexcused absences for children who are 14 to 17. The, the bill I introduced, I would have all children 5 to 17 referred to court social services for that 10th unexcused absence so we can do a root cause analysis uh, of, of that family to find out what the obstacles are. Uh, there is some pushback from the executive on that particular point, but I believe that working together, uh, reasoning through this and through a broad community forum, we can come up with a solution that we can all support. Uh, the most important thing, I, I, I think I speak for all of us on the Council, isn't that our particular proposal be embraced in total. What's important is that we have a mutual agreement that we, that both uh, the Executive and the Council feels will move this effort forward uh, and solve the underlying problem. We have too many children who are not in school and their, their lives are being diminished as a result. So uh, I want to thank the Executive, um, Mr. Chairman, many of the people in this room who will testify for the constructive way in which they've engaged the Council. And I look forward to continuing our uh, efforts to improve um, school attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Catania. Uh, Mr. Grasso? Uh, I don't have an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Berry? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, truancy is not one that just affects the District of Columbia. Every urban system in America suffers from this, particularly with low-income uh, students. Let me also be clear that truancy is not an issue that's limited in scope or responsibility to the school system, both public and private. The chancellor shouldn't have to be bogged down with paperwork and other kind of things. Let her do her job of innovative, innovative transforming these schools, making schools uh, that kids want to go to, looking at academic challenges, look at closing the academic gap. And truancy often involves a range of issues that spill beyond the whole of our schools. Let me also be clear. We are moving in uncharted waters. Every school district has this problem is moving in uncharted waters. This is not a blame game. There's enough blame to go around. This is not a posturing game. We want to take credit for stuff that you did or did not do. This is a serious issue involving the students in our public and parochial schools, and as well as our uh, charter schools. According to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency, prevention, the mo four main factors that contribute to truancy are family, school, economic influences, and student variables. Truant students often have various issues at home that affect their attendance at school, such as a lack of guidance from parental supervision, domestic violence, poverty, and drug or substance abuse. School factors, such as the school size 
attitudes of teachers and flexibility. And is that five minutes? Uh, you got a minute left. It's okay. three minutes for opening statements. Okay. Anyway, I'm proposing that we, when things start out wrong, they end up wrong. And what started out as well as intentioned as it was by the mayor and other people, it's going to end up wrong because we have put the burden on our school system. That's not the right. I'm going to propose to the mayor that he, by executive order, expand the uh, truancy task force to include every agency, every agency that touches children, whether it's recreation, whether it's mental health, whether it's health, uh, whether it's DORS, whether it's CSFA, and also to be chaired by the city administrator. The chancellor doesn't have the authority to tell mental health to do this, to do that, to do that. The chancellor doesn't have the authority to tell recreation to do this and do that. And so the city administrator does have that authority. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we need a communication system, which I'll talk about a little bit later. There's no way that, that these agencies can communicate with each other. I talked to Ms. Brenda Don the other day. She said she got something either from the school system of the URS that just gave the name and the birthday of the student. And I'm going to advocate social security numbers as a way of tracking everything we do in the city government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barry. So let's proceed now with the first witness. I asked him if he had a question, yeah, if he had a statement. Um, if uh, Assistant Chief Diane Grooms could come forward. Uh, our expectation is you don't have a statement, so you're here to answer uh, questions that we may have. Uh, if you'd raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia, Committee of the Whole, and Committee on Education is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. And you answered in the affirmative. Okay, we, we will begin with Mr. Catania. Uh, Chief, uh, welcome. Um, I want to look. I want to start with some of the truancy violations that we uh, have. The committee has received from uh, MPD for this particular school year, 2012-2013. Uh, and as of January, because that's uh, and it's not a complete month, but from September through the first part of January, there were 1,890. Uh, truancy violations. Can you explain to the committee what were the consequences for these violations? What happened? How were they processed? Etc. Okay. Well, good afternoon to all. Afternoon. Um, as you know, um, the Metropolitan Police Department we enforce truancy by providing. Uh, we have two officers per district. That basically that's the only rule they have is to go around from 9:30 in the morning till <laughs> two to pick up youth um, that appear to be in, in the school age and we bring them back to um, their assigned school, either DCPS, charter, or the, even the parochial schools. Those children that we find are not enrolled in any school. Um, DCPS has created a great um, program at Elliott, um, a student center where they try to engage and reconnect the youth um, back into the school. Uh, the process ba basically is a lot of times we know the hangouts. Um, we get calls from citizens as well or while we are on patrol, um, just because you're a truancy officer doesn't mean my regular patrol officers have no responsibility. A lot of times they see youth as well, and they'll call the truancy officers that assist. Um, we pick them up. We uh, run them through our whale system, if we can identify them, um, to see if they have any missing person reports, if they have any custody orders out on them. Um, if there is a custody order, we then do not take back to the school. We take them to our juvenile processing center to take care of the warrant. Um, if they're a missing person, uh, we do take to the school and we notify the parent or the guardian that, you know, the child has been located as well as do a report about closing out the missing person. Can I can ask you, if the child runs, are you permitted to chase the child? Uh, my officers, we have chased them. However, we cannot utilize force. We do not put the children into handcuffs because literally it's not considered an arrest or um, an offense. Um, usually we, actually I've seen it a lot of times. The kids will just jump into the van um, and we do take them um, to the schools. Um, what happens once you take them to the school? What they usually, the school has designated an area in the office that we bring them to. Um, the officer brings them into the office. Uh, we exchange, uh, we fill out a piece of paperwork called a 379, explaining where we stopped them, their identification, and we turn that over to DCPS, and um, we then leave um, the school. And what happens to the child at that point? Um, 
usually then the school administrators, um, you know, um, usually get to take the child to class or sometimes they will, you know, sit down with them to notify the parent as well. So we receive reports that as soon as MPD drops the child off, no sooner than MPD leaves, then the child often goes out the back door. Are you aware of situations like that? Uh, there have been times um, some of our challenging youth, um, it has occurred when we walk, again, the children are not escorted by force or in handcuffs. They will run away from us in the school and there have been times they run out of the school and we have to try to track them down again. And so your vans have a capacity of 10 uh, individuals? 10 to 15. And yes. so when there are more kids than capacity in the van, what happens? Unfortunately, um, we'll does try that to... happen? It, it does happen. I mean, there, the need and the issue, I mean, it's, 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 it's rather large. Um, we, a lot of times, too, we run into the parents out there and the parents um, happen to, um, you know, help us get the kids to school or a lot of times the children, uh, we do not focus a lot of times if it's right in front of the school, we get out and usually the children will walk into school themselves. Are you finding that truant kids are committing crimes when they should be in school? What I, what I like to do, um, there are not all, not all children Some. that are truant um, are out there committing crimes. In fact, today I had an example. We did have two young youth from a charter school uh, rob somebody at nine, it was about 9.30 in the morning. I asked who they were. Um, we found out they were from a charter school and they didn't like their first period teacher, so they decided to be outside. And uh, we did make apprehensions and we're trying to reconnect them back to um, their school. They've never been arrested before. But usually when a child gets arrested, I do, um, DCPS has been very cooperative. We find out what their attendance record is um, and try to reconnect a lot of them back to school. I was, I was uh, informed that there was a problem, though, that DCPS lacks, or that MPD lacks access to DCPS's attendance records and that DCPS doesn't share the records of chronic truants. Is that true or not? Well, literally by law, the FERPA law, records, unless the parent consents to turn over any kind of records, uh, literally DCPS can say they're not going to share or give us that information. But there, aren't there exceptions to that law? Um, DCPS has been very cooperative, um, especially for if it's a law enforcement purpose or if we want to do a home visit with the principal or a tenants counselor, we do get that information. Thank you, Chief. Yes. Uh, Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just have kind of a couple of kind of follow up but also additional questions. What? What impact do you think it has on truancy? Do you see a lot of repeat out there, you know, of these children out there, of you guys picking them up and taking them to school? I mean, that is one of our challenges. We do not, uh, due to the fact it's still pen and paper, uh, we don't have a database system where, you know, we enter all the names and see who the repeats are. There's a couple kids, if you ask my truancy officers, they yes. know some of the repeats. Yeah. And that's when we go a step further to work with, we do do the home visits or connect them back with the school. Um, but I would say majority, the ones we have picked up, we did study it for uh, like a six-month period. Majority of the kids were one to three picked up the first time or for three times in a row. Okay. And so they're kind of the repeat offenders, of, so to speak, of being truant. And you must, I mean, you said there was two officers per school? Is per dis no, per, per dis district. So I have 14 officers okay, 14 that total. do this as their main role. What happens when you have a, a student that's been expelled from school and you find them on the street? Do they just tell you, oh, I was expelled, I'm not skipping? Well, that's one of the challenges for my truancy officers or my officers also on duty because um, a lot of the principals have asked for assistance, you know, especially in the morning hours that a lot of people are congregating. <laughs> and when we do stop um, a lot of youth, uh, you know, we make sure they're of the age that are truant, some of them do have um, passes that, you know, maybe they've been expelled, suspended. They also, a lot of schools are being progressive with hours. There's like night academy. So it might be 11 a.m., but their class is until later. So not all the kids, in, you know, from the public perception, like all these kids are hanging out. Uh, right. Some of them are legally allowed out there. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Um, and then I guess last is kind of a... I don't know, kind of a look back a little bit in, in time. And I don't know. I've heard from people in the street and parents in the past that there were police that used to 
company kids to school and stuff like that and programs is that still happening or not and do you think that has any impact on kind of a child wanting to be in school and wanting to be a part of the education process as opposed to being truant well my truancy officers again it's not just about picking up kids a lot of them are very engaged with that family and also with the programming in a lot of the other agencies dcps but i have the school resource officers now that are in a lot of the schools and the roving you know, they rove to all the schools from elementary all the way up to the high schools and they reconnect. Um, back, I would say, back like in 2000, or probably around 2000, we used to have a unit called Youth Services. Um, but, you know, at the time we didn't have our school safety division where we did have officers off the street and kids would be brought in, you know, um, instead of being taken to the school sometimes, they'd be coming to our police precinct, which a lot of youth advocates do not agree bringing ki children into police precincts of, due to rights, um, and um, counseled and trying to reconnect at that time. But a lot of that has evolved um, due to more communication between agencies, nonprofits. Uh, we do that more out in the field versus bringing them back to the police station. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Grasso. Councilmember Berry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Chief Grove, you know, uh, you and I talk a lot, do a lot of work together. And I represent uh, Ward 8, most Ward 8 is in the 7th District, some of it in the 6th District. Are you saying that for each district, you only have two officers and one van to do this work? Uh, correct. Each district only has two officers. However, that does not stop the regular officers in the scout cars or little SUVs now. To Chief Groom, you know and to, I know. Mm -hmm. If the regular scout cars are out picking up kids, they can't make these runs correct. to a crime. Is that correct? That, that is true. Also, do you see this problem as larger than the police department, larger than the school system, but a citywide problem? Well, uh, I am a part of, I, well, MPD is part of the um, truancy task force. No, I just asked you if you saw that. Oh, yes. It's yeah, everyone. Absolutely. From the see, parents. I'm making the point mm -hmm. that we started out wrong, as well-intentioned as we were. We're going to end up wrong. Just like two officers, one van mm -hmm. in the 7th District and the 6th District has two, but they got to go to the other side of the 6th District. I have seen kids in the alleys uh, somewhere behind Baloo, near Baloo, mm -hmm. and there were 14 or 15 of them over there. Right. And I have I've seen the ineffectiveness of picking them up like that. Suppose you pick up five kids from Blue, uh, five from Hart, uh, five, uh, six from um, uh, Forever Hope, and if you are Harris from Isaiah. What I'm making is that suppose you pick up 20 kids. How do you logistically get them separated to take some over here, take some over there, which means why they're doing that that truancy unit is out of service. Is that right? Yes, you're correct. And so we got to rethink all of this. And as I said, it's not your fault, not anybody else's fault in the system. It's that it wasn't thought out because we are uncharted waters. Also, when the officers take students to the school, do they actually take them inside the school or take them to the school door or they let them out at the school door? What do they do? I don't know. We take them inside the school, and like I said, each school has designated an area for us to take them to. Well, how are they able to run away when that happens? They just... Yeah, the, a lot of times, again, they're not in handcuffs, nor are, do we have a physical restraint on them. Um, a lot of times, it could be, like I said, three or four children were taken back to, say, Hart, and we usually, most times... It's not your help. responsibility as to what happens to them once you take them to the school, right? Well, at that point, we return them back to school, correct? Also, you indicated that this is all a paper system, which in this high-tech society is ridiculous that we have that kind of system, Mr. Mr. Uh, Catania, uh, Chairman. And so uh, we need to look at how we use technology to capture this. That's not just true of you all. In every agency that I have uh, under the control of human services and, and other agencies, they don't have a coordinated informational system where 
you send it over here. You ought to know the people at any public school ought to know how many of these students have been chronically picked up. So you can have some other intervention methods as though you picked up five times, ten times. The other one is uh, in terms of intervention. Does the police department have programs of prevention of young people, intervention with young people before they get truant or before they get arrested? Uh, we have a lot of different programs, especially during the summer, but all throughout the year. Um, my SROs, we have our youth division um, outreach specialists. We have civilian outreach that do major seminars, presentations, and do uh, work with kids after hours. I understand that, but they're, they're, the load is too heavy for what we have. I just tell you that. The last report I saw, and my pet on Malou, because Blue is, is a good school, good principal, et cetera. Last numbers I saw was 441 chronically truant people there, which means that your truancy situation is far understaffed to take care of the need. Also, is Elliot the only place in the city that officers take uh, young people who are not enrolled in any school? Uh, we take them, um, like I said, DCPS has a, um, established Elliot, a space in Elliot Hines for that program. That's all? Uh, well, but thank the whole city? majority of the Wait kids minute, who Mr. pick up Chairman. do have a second round. There'll be a second round. No. All right, well, this will be your uh, second One member round. of the council went over 50 seconds, so I'm going to take my 50 seconds. Uh, in terms of Elliot being the only place for all the, the truants well, for that are out of school. Well, unenrolled. Huh? We, only for those that, we, that are not enrolled. That's what I just said. Right. But those are out of, out of, which means that if you find a student way up in Upper Tacoma Park, right. Or somewhere way out in far southeast uh, on uh, Bayberry Road or Grant Street or uh, 51st Street. They had to come all the way over to Elliott, which means while they're doing that, that unit is out of service. Is that correct? Yes. All right. We've got to rethink all this. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Catania, you had additional questions? Uh, Chief Grooms, my office has become uh, aware of a particular uh, student uh, that I think is illustrative of a problem. It was a young 13-year-old girl who transferred from Johnson Middle School to Deal. Uh, she, since the transfer from Johnson to Deal in January, there have literally been a dozen missing reports filed against her. She's missed hundreds of classes and more than 15 unexcused absences. Um, you know, at the time uh, that she went missing last week, uh, DCPS had not yet referred her to CFSA and MPD stated that they uh, that they would refer to, to CFSA. What you know, what is wrong here with the system where a child can have so many missing reports and presumably connect with the police department in the process, miss hundreds of classes, and 15 days of school in less than a month and a half? Uh, under the law, she should be referred to CFSA. And you know. What I guess I'm feeling a little wanting about is we have, you know, by, by again, your statistics that your office provided, nearly 1,900 kids who were, who were picked up for truancy, which is a fraction of the actual truant kids. I mean, that's true, correct? Yes. Ni 1,900 is a, is a fraction of those. Those are just because of the logistics of the size of your van, the amount of time it takes to take children back, and so on. You know, wh how would you, uh, as someone who is uh, on the streets every day, engaged in this, where you, you know, this is one of your responsibilities, how would you have the council uh, revisit this subject to be more effective in, in either tracking, obtaining, uh, you know, maybe it's the access, the parental access to information so MPD can have greater uh, access to truancy data from the schools, you know, um, whether it's the procedure of how you stay with the child once you drop them off at school, you just you you could inform this committee considerably if you tell us how you might have us uh, you know tweak our truancy laws. Well, that's a good question, sir. And again, on the truancy task force, and believe me, we've had many many conversations between many of the parties in the room, and um, we actually have discussed. I know I've sat down with Adele before about how we do the truancy enforcement. Um, Personally, us just picking them up and returning from a school, is that the best practice? For the public, yes, because they see the children out there. They don't want them hanging out. Also, we're happy to take them off the streets so they don't get involved in crime or become a victim of a crime. However, I think we've had conversations that maybe we should really focus 
on those core groups and you know MPD along with our partners and um, so would you support I'm sorry for you, homes. but in the limited time would you support uh, you know because we often will hide behind you know kind of urban myth about we can't do this because there's this law or we can't do this because of that law some are our own interpretations some are our own impediment would you support uh, a more aggressive MOU between MPD and the school system where they would be required to uh, to, 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 to let you access their truancy information, their attendance information, so you can, once you pick a child up, yourself have a full sense of the seriousness of the situation? Um, I mean, we would definitely would like to engage in that for, you know, again, on behalf of the child and the family, you know, it's for law enforcement and also for the child welfare purposes and the family um, to see what we can, how we can assist. So other than simply, and again, we, you, you stipulated the 1,890 uh, children you picked up between August and early January was a fraction of those who are truant. Uh, other than taking the child back to school, are there any consequences to the children or to the parents for the children not being in school even though we have a compulsory attendance law? Well, I do know that DCPS has made an effort now to definitely flag um, the MPD pickups. Um, and, and I think it generates a, definitely a call or contact to that parent. But I, I ask, uh, the issue was of consequences. And so the fact that whether you pick the child mm -hmm. up or if the child just doesn't show up, MPD has a new regiment that flows out of the South Capital Act that has been more aggressive at notifying parents and trying to engage them. But my question was one of consequences. You know, uh, we have the police department engaging considerable resources and picking children up sometimes by your testimony, repeat offenders. Um, so you have a couple of thousand, in, uh, you know, in, in actions by the police department, but, but are there any consequences? No um, such like disciplinary or criminal consequences. However, referrals have been made for services. Right. Uh, and I guess that's kind of what leads us here. Do you, do you uh, Chief Grooms, in my remaining seconds, do you have any other recommendations for this body on how we might address this issue? Um, again, I believe what our task force is working on um, and getting further resources for families and for these children, you know, w will work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Catania. Mr. Grasso, questions? Mr. Berry? Mr. Chairman, following up uh, with part of that, uh, Chief Groom, you have made my case without knowing you made it, mm -hmm. that this expanded task force has to be brought up to a higher level and the city administrator ought to chair it. Because if this came up during a discussion between uh, the chancellor and yourself in the task force, the city administrator could have moved to make those adjustments to give you more officers or chief give you more officers or something. Because you admit it, and Mr. Can you're right. This is just a fraction of those on things. I approach it a little bit differently. I look at it programmatically. What happens to a kid once he's taken to the school? Programmatically, what happens to him or her to try to get them on the right track? What kind of support services do you need to do that? And so, uh, again, my case is that the present task force, any task force ought to be judged by what are the results of their work. If you ask the chancellor, I ask the head of the charter school board to give you statistics on truant this time last year and this time this year, I bet you're going to find there's been not much of a difference. After all the hard work you all have done, as, as sincere as you all are, as committed as you all are, you, you, you uh, judge your work by the results of what you do. Because I believe that the city and the task force and everybody in it and the council ought to have some measurable goals. So we're going to reduce truancy by 15% this year. We're going to reduce it by 18% next year. So we can measure the effectiveness of our program. That's what David calls evidence-based uh, analysis. That's what I call at being trained as a scientist, how you do it. And so this is not personal against anybody, not personal against you, against any department. It's endemic to the system, like the people that you all have. 
that's not your your fault, and that's not the chief's fault, really. This is the system that we probably inherited it, a problem, a system that was unanticipated. Nobody anticipated that you would be called in to deal this much with these many young people. And so I just, just made my case on it. Now, in terms of uh, what happens, you, read, you said that there's no, it's just a paper. We can put out 379. It's just a paper thing. And where does it go when you fill it out? Uh, one copy is left with the child um, at the school, and then we actually. Is that at the school, too? Yeah, we li leave it with, uh, with the school, yes. You leave it with the, children, with the student? Well, not with the student, but with the, you know, in the administrative office. Right. How do you, have you asked the chancellor what happens to it after it's given to the administrator? Yeah, we've had conversations. Now, have you that. asked the chancellor what happens to each 379 that they leave at the school? When, with that, right? The answer is no. So I would suggest that you figure out how to ask the other departments that kind of question. Again, my case is made that you need to see the administrator on top of all this. One, it indicates a sense of urgency. It indicates a sense of seriousness. And then put some of you who are working as hard as you can in a bind that you get put into. You're not responsible for not having uh, more than two offices. Uh, not responsible for not having but one van. You're not responsible for Elliot being the only place that set up to take these young people. What I'm saying is that we're on a treadmill. You come back this time next year if you don't do something different. We had the same kind of discussions. I've been in this council since 2005. Maybe 16 years. I know how that works that way. And so my question of you, I'll be very clear. I'm criticizing the system that's set up that's not effective. The task force, as meaningful as you all are, as hardworking as you are, has not made a dent in reducing truancy in the District of Columbia. Simple as that. So uh, thank you, thank you, Chief Coon. You've been a wonderful chief. You've done great things. And you on the scene every time I'm anything happening with Ward Eight, Seventh District, that's major. You on the scene. I commend you for that. Thank you. I commend you for that. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Berry. Um, when when they when you pick up a kid, if you know what school they belong to, you take them to that school. Correct. You take them to Elliott when uh, you don't know what school they belong to. Right. If they, either they refuse or they are not enrolled into any school. Uh, would you say that? Uh, um, is it your sense that we've made improvement or things have gotten worse uh, this year compared to last year? How, how would you compare this year with last year? Well, actually, um, the numbers that we have picked up are, you know, not as many as we did uh, last year. Uh, you know, again, we pick up a fraction of, you know, who, of what's out there. Um, but I think definitely our connections with all the agencies, and believe me, I mean, I'm sure many can tell you every day, I am speaking to someone from CFSA, uh, DRS, CSS um, regarding a youth. But the numbers are down that you're picking up. Uh, ours is yes. Um, and is your your um, are you saying also that the level of interaction between MPD and other agencies is greater this year? Uh, we've or had great relationships. It's just I mean I believe that wasn't my question. I'm yeah, looking well, for I've, comparison. I know I've I've had great support. I've always had. Um, they're very responsive, and I think the task force has brought just not just two or three agencies together, but all agencies plus some outside supports which are needed. Um, you've had 1890 pickups, according to the data that um, your department gave Mr. Catania. Is that 1890 different kids or just 1890 pickups? That I, I can just say that is pickups. Uh, again, we really do not know out of that number how many are re repeaters. And of course, you're missing some kids. Uh, as you acknowledge, you, you don't pick up all the kids. You only Correct. pick up those that you see. Um, do you feel that there should be a better process for picking up kids? Uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean. It, do we need more vans or a metro bus? Uh, again, um, it's we provide the service, um, and to me, that's 1,890 kids that got back into school instead of being on the streets. Now, for that. 
Do you, um, a year ago, the first hearing we had, which was in July, um, uh, kind of confirmed my suspicion that you were picking up kids who were truant and the school system was not marking them as truant. Do you have a sense that the kids you're picking up as truant today are being marked as truant? Well, again, I think through the task force that was that took a while for us to define exactly what truant was. MPD, at first, we had a very strong different definition. I mean, if you're out of school, we thought you're out of school. Our task force is focusing on the chronic truant. However, DCPS this year has done a great job where our pickups now trigger that parent notification and um, they're raised at a different level versus just they weren't even being counted as truant before or even noticed that, I mean, now they are flagged. I mean, you and I have had some private mm -hmm. conversations with a sense of frustration about um, kids not being recognized as truant. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm pursuing, and I think what I'm hearing from you is you, you feel that that's improved substantially. Well, again, the definition that everyone in the city is working on, of course, is the chronic truant. Um, our definition on a daily basis if we catch any child that's not in school during those school hours. What should be the role of MPD in all this? Um, the, uh, should you simply be to pick them up or um, should you actually be providing more services or something in between? What do you think the role of MPD should be? Well, again, I, I, that's a lot of conversations I have with other people, exactly what is our skill level. We are not mental health professionals nor social workers with certain trainings. Um, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of my officers are skilled at mediation or talking uh, to parents and talking to the children. Not all of them are, not every officer out there is fit to do youth work. Um, but, I mean, definitely I think pickups are very important for the public as well as just for the kids out there to get them off the street. Um, but we do expand our role into going into doing home visits as well and group home visits as well. When, and when do you do that? When, it, when the kid is identified as enough of a concern by the youth division that then you would get more involved? Is that when you would do that? No, a lot of my truancy officers, they kind of you know it might not be recorded in a database but they kind of are very familiar with the children that are need more guidance on getting into school or getting to school on time um, or um, they come to our attention through citizens residents and even from other agencies and we tend to focus and go to the home um, thank you as co-chair do you have one of the okay uh, chief grooms um, at this point, the, the system seems to serve more like a, an imperfect net uh, than a complete foolproof system. We rely on a limited number of truancy officers, officers limited supply, and, and we don't capture all the kids that are truant. We get some and we, turn, we return others. Uh, the current system, which doesn't have it, and we are fortunate if we have it, if the school system, and we're talking about charters and traditional public schools, the only um, mechanism that in which you know, authorities are identified or told about a problem is if a child misses uh, 25 days of school. Uh, and that triggers, um, you know, again, if the school system you know, takes the chance or takes the opportunity to inform court so uh, social services, it's at the 25-day mark. Um, do you believe that is an adequate number? Or do you have an opinion as to whether or not uh, we should keep it where it is or, or if we should reduce it to a, a, a lesser number, a lower number? Well, I, I believe I'm in support of probably, a, I mean, 25 days is like five weeks over a month of school missing. Again, I think everyone will agree that if someone's out of school that long, you lose cohesiveness or connection to studies or even to the school program. So uh, I believe DCPS does have a trigger, however, prior to the um, formal um, referral. I think we, they we actually have, uh, call before that. We, we have, uh, again, the number of children who are actually referred or a fraction of those who are eligible. So what I'm, I'm looking at are a series of buckets that are filled with holes. I'm left with an MPD bucket that catches a few and good luck with the rest. And then I'm, I'm, I'm left with, well, in, uh, DCPS will do this when charter schools aren't even in this equation. They're not even in this room. And we have, charter pro we have truancy problems in our charter schools too and they're nowhere to be found. They're not in this discussion, right? So we, we, we hope that uh, DCPS once a certain number of 25 absences are accumulated that there will be a wherewithal to refer it to court social services and there are holes in that system because not all the kids who are eligible are referred 
Once we get to those who are actually referred, we require the Attorney General to actually proceed with those uh, complaints. And if the, if, if the court social services kicks them back for being inadequate, that's a barrier. And if the Attorney General simply doesn't prosecute, that's a barrier. So at the end of the day, we have untold number of kids. We don't have good data on how many kids who have simply fallen through the cracks because we have one imperfect net after another. Uh, I agree that this is, this is a, a problem uh, that cuts across every part of our city, uh, you know, and it's incumbent upon us to offer solutions on how to solve it. I think this permissive attitude we've had, this is 25 days is good, well, let's just hope that the next bureaucracy over will catch it. That just isn't working. And so what I'm attempting to do is to tighten these loopholes. Uh, and I, I haven't discussed, frankly, how we might tighten the responsibility of individuals who are picked up. We have 1,800 plus kids who are picked up by you in the first half of a school year uh, where there have been no consequences, no one held to account for the resources that are expended on your behalf, on the school's behalf, uh, and, and no adult held responsible for the actions of their children. Nothing. That's what we have. We have you taking kids back, eating up resources, and a clamor for more money. And so let's talk about the Truancy Task Force. We are spending money on the Truancy Task Force, and I don't mean to diminish that good things have happened, but the sum total number of kids who are served through the buyer court model and through the high school task force, this high school case management program that looks at some of our, 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 school, our high schools with the highest uh, truancy rate, we are, as of now, as of today, we are serving 53 children in this high school case management program and exactly seven in the middle school buyer model. So we have 60 children out of thousands that are receiving the so-called social services that we all talk about. That, again, seems to me another pail full of holes that kids keep falling through. Um, you know, I think we have to keep talking uh, with each other. We have to keep, and this goes for all the agencies, we have to keep thinking about how we might want to fix this and improve this. And I look forward to continued dialogue with MPD because I found you to be a great resource, MPD, to want to do the right things. But we need to stitch these bureaucracies together. We don't have to have a perfect plan. But right now we have far from it. We have a, a terribly inadequate plan. And so I look forward to continuing this discussion. I do think we're making progress, Chief, and I think it has a lot to do with, with you and your truancy officers, although you need, you need more resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Catania. Thank you, uh, Chief Gooms. I appreciate your being here. Um, the, um, yes. Well, Mr. Catania is the co-chair of this hearing. And we have three other witnesses to code you. No, I need five minutes left. Um, Mr. Berry, I will give you some additional that. time. Okay, give we me have time. A, we have a number of, we have several witnesses. We're going to be here for several hours. Uh, with all due respect to Assistant Chief Groom, she's not the primary witness here today. Mr. Catania and I are co-chairing this hearing. Mr. Catania representing the Education Committee, I thought that when he said that he had an additional question, that that was um, perfectly appropriate because he is the co-chair of this hearing. May I Mr. proceed, Mr. Chairman? Let me just make it clear. The council has rules that does not give the chair, uh, don't give some attitude, but anyway, I won't deal with that. Mr. Catania, you are exactly where I am in terms of results. I, I like your analogy of buckets with holes in it. So there's no criticism of anybody individually. It's a criticism of the system. We have to raise the level of how we solve these problems. And I maintain under the present structure of the t uh, task force, there's not the mechanism to solve all these problems. That's why I want to move it to the city administrator who can order, if necessary, agency A to do these things. Agency B to do these things. It may not be necessary, but I'll be available for them. And also, Chief and everybody who's listening, <coughs> I'm resource oriented. You know, and I use a simple analogy, and it's not perfect. You can have an automobile, put it in neutral, but have a whole text, tank of gas. It ain't going nowhere. Nowhere. And so I'm resource oriented in terms of quantifiable, uh, evidentially based results as Mr. Catania is. And so our analysis and criticism are not meant to be personal at all. If sometimes people take it that way, mine is meant to be constructive, to be helpful, and to give a new insight to this problem. I had the same problem when I was mayor. I didn't have the power that I have now because 
the Board of Education ran the school system, I didn't have the vision that I have now, that this problem is greater than just the school system, but parochial, I mean, uh, the charter and et cetera. And so one thing I encourage people to do, Chief Coon, and you, you've done this before the council many times, is if things are not working, say they're not working. Also, I believe in quantifiable data. Just because you have 1% less than what you had last year, it's like, I hate to use this analogy, but I will, like beating your wife. I stopped from seven days to five days. You're still beating your wife. And so, unlike Mr. Catania to some extent, I look on the other end of it. What programs do we put in place to come out with a positive result? I think punishment ought to be the last uh, train, last car on this train. Do everything we can to keep these kids, keep these parents involved with support services, correct them. And some of them are intractable. They're intractable. Uh, Ms. Brennan McDonald talked about the fact that in child neglect cases, almost 40% of those cases, there's alcohol and drug abuse involved in it. And that's a very serious problem. She also said they had 58 uh, young people referred to APRA, and only five or six showed up. 51 didn't show up. That's what I look at in terms of being a uh, It's not her fault. It's the system's fault. You don't have any way to track that in any way to, to, to try to correct that. And those of us on the streets and those of us on the council who deal with young people knew they wouldn't show up. They weren't going to show up. The person that she had there didn't know that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, other members. And I think we all are headed the right way. Some of us may differ how you get there. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Thank you again, Assistant Chief Grooms. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Donald, if you could come forward. Before you sit down, we're going to swear you in. Yes. If you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you swear from under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia, Committees on Education and Committee of the Whole, is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You, may be, you answered it in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, do you have a statement? Yes, I do. And, I've and submitted do we it have to copies staff. of it? Yes. Ready? When you're ready, yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Chairman um, Catania, and Councilmember Barry. I am Brenda Donald, Director of the D.C. Child and Family Services Agency. I welcome this opportunity to update you on our collaboration with the D.C. Public Schools to address the issues around school attendance or truancy. It is really heartening to see a citywide response on such an important child well-being issue. As you know, CFSA has a very specific role regarding truancy, and it fits within a broader educational neglect statute. When mandated reporters, or concerned neighbors for that matter, believe a school-aged child is not in school because of abuse or neglect, they are obligated to call our hotline. Even more specifically, Title V of the District of Columbia Mun Municipal Regulation requires reporting to CFSA um, whenever a student between the ages of 5 and 13 has 10 unexcused absences within a school year, requires, DCPS or re requires the schools to report. While the vast majority of the reports under this requirement result in no findings of abuse or neglect, we readily accept this responsibility because educational neglect may be a window into the life of a child in danger. When a young child is chronically absent and the parents haven't responded to the calls and letters from the schools that precede their hotline reports, it is a family issue. More than likely, it is something that can be resolved with one-time resources or ongoing services, but sometimes it truly is abuse or neglect and we must step in to protect the children. When I testified at the Attendance Accountability Act hearing two weeks ago, I gave an update on the 819 truancy referrals we received from all sources from the beginning of this school year to January 15, 2013. Between January 15 and February 8, we received an additional 321 reports. So now we have a total for this school year of 1,240 reports. 844 of those are from DCPS. At this rate, the reports are trending 50% higher than last school year. We're averaging about 250 um, uh, plus reports a month to our hotline. Of these reports, only about 35% are substantiated, which means that they meet the legal standard for child neglect. And this is consistent with last year's findings. So although the volume of reports has doubled, the rate of neglect findings is about the same. If I may interrupt, the, the number has gone up 
uh, because we're further into the year. I'm not talking about gone up this year compared to last year, but you were at uh, t um, 819, and then another 321 came in right. in less than a month. Yes. Uh, that's because the reports come at 10 days or more, and so the number of reports are going to go up. Sure. Yeah, you would expect, right, as the year goes on, since it's not, you know, the more time that the child has to be in school, then you're spreading out the, um, you know, the time okay. that they would be through. And also, I mean, it's, and you'll hear from, um, from the chancellor, you know, the, the higher compliance rates that the schools have um, been, been making the reports as compared to last year. So it's both and. It's the time of the year and it's the level of compliance. Um, approximately one-third of the reports are filtered out because they are out of jurisdiction, the absences are actually excused, or for some other administrative reason. The rest of the cases are addressed by one-time immediate fixes or referred to community-based organizations for ongoing assistance. As we have reported previously, CFSA and DCPS have made significant strides to ensure compliance with the reporting requirements, as well as to build a partnership that shares information and works together on strategies to address truancy. The first part of this school year, our focus is, has primarily been on compliance. Um, last school year, DCPS only referred about 21 percent of the required cases to our hotline. As of January 15th, the compliance rate was up to 74 percent, and I believe it's up to over 90 percent now. So it's getting better and better. Reports are coming in real time. Each month, CFSA and DCPS have a standing meeting to review the data to ensure that all referrals that should have been made were actually made and those that were not are subsequently and immediately referred. Now that we have a systematic way of checking compliance in real time, we are able to start focusing on what the data show. Over the next few weeks, we'll be sitting down with DCPS to compare notes about what we're finding, whether or not our knocks on the door are resulting in kids going back to school, whether there are discernible trends in particular schools, and so on. We believe this level of data analysis and feedback is necessary to help all of us understand what the real barriers are and what interventions are needed to impact school attendance. A Children's Research Center literature review of studies on the effectiveness of child protective response on educational neglect reached this conclusion. While response from child protection may appear appropriate for educational neglect, given the lack of understanding of the mechanisms by which these factors influence truancy, more evidence is needed to establish child protective services as an effective intervention to school attendance related issues. I believe we have shown how serious we all are in our efforts to reduce truancy. And while we will continue to respond to reports of educational neglect, we also need time to analyze the data and evaluate the effectiveness of our interventions. We appreciate the Council's interest and oversight on this important issue and look forward to working with you to get better results. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Donald. I thought you were going to have, based on the uh, meeting last week, I thought you were going to have more of, uh, what do I want to say? Um, no, more strategies that you were going to unveil today. Right. So I thought that my response today was um, as CFSA director in okay. response to what we're doing around educational neglect reporting, rather than representing the broader task force, which was in a different role. And who's going to represent the broader task force? I'm not sure that they were invited to they testify. They were more than welcome. All right. Well, um, I'm, we'll proceed with questions. But I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to answer questions about where we are at this point and discussions um, about um, tightening up some of the, the solutions and recommendations, and some of them are still in progress. And, Councilmember Catania alluded to a few of those in terms of increased um, follow-up and reporting and letters and um, shortening the period of time for reporting, but we're not much further along. Um, all right, so the number of cases that have been reported have increased, and they will probably continue to increase this year because uh, students are reported at 10 days, and there might be a whole bunch at eight days right. now, and they're going to all get reported. Um, are you um, still finding that you're able to absorb this? I know that it's a, st a strain, but are you right. still able to absorb it? We are absorbing it. I mean, we're able to shift vacant positions. Um, you know, fortunately, our overall foster care caseloads have gone down, and so that's how we've been able to absorb it by okay. shifting vacant positions. But we have had to staff up, I mean, add about 25 positions in our Child Protective Services Division just for this. It's been an enormous increase. It's about 25 percent of our investigations. Uh, and I think you said that about, um, 
I have in my mind, uh, you said something like, 30, oh, 35 percent are substanti substantiated. Yes. So that's perhaps cases that you would have gotten later and perhaps when there was more damage. Some. That's correct. And that's why we welcome this opportunity to go in as early as someone has identified that a child may be in trouble and lack of school attendance. You said... Home. You said, I, I'm on a clock, that's why I'm pushing along sure. here. Mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, in many of the cases are addressed by one-time immediate fixes. I assume that's probably something like uh, a little bit of counseling or talking to a parent. Or, I'm reading here, or referred to community-based organizations for ongoing assistance. Would that be, for example, to the collaboratives? It could be to a collaborative. It could be to a mental health service provider if that's the issue. We found a number of families that I have medical. I want to pursue that. How much are you doing that? Because it seems to me that that's key here. Mm -hmm. If a kid is truant because of mental health issues, either with the kid or in the family, then um, really that's something that Department of Mental Health or somebody else can, can address. Right. And I think a lot of truancy is due to factors like that. How robust is this referral to community-based organizations? Well, I mean, we, we do that. We, we refer to the appropriate organizations based on the findings, but what I said in my testimony is that we're just getting to the point now where we're really going underneath all of the data to see, in addition to whether or not we found that it was a substantiated abuse or neglect case or not, then what, what are the findings, what are the follow-up, what are some of the themes, and we've, we've just been unpacking that data, and that's, that's where we are now um, to really identify that in a more um, systemic way so that we can say, here are the interventions that are really necessary. But I mean, as far as, you know, what, whenever there's a case and, and you know, based on the needs, we're going to refer to the appropriate, to the appropriate agency. Well, I would think some of this is interesting. Um, a lot of it is uh, important in terms of what the budget is. Uh, if, if most of the cases that are being referred are due to mental health, then we know we have to put more resources right. into mental health. But other than the budgetary need, I don't know how much I need to know how many of these cases are mental health as opposed to domestic violence, as opposed to um, an issue with the child being illiterate, uh, as opposed to transportation. Um, I don't know how much we need to right. know. We need to know that well, data. You need to know it, or rather the government needs to right. know it in terms of budgeting. And we need to know it in terms of strategies. And so you talk about the task force and all of the agencies that are participating in the task force. We make some assumptions um, based on a lot of anecdotal information, like, for example, transportation. We know we hear stories that transportation is an issue, but we don't know how often, how much, where it is, if we provide transportation vouchers, is that going to in and of itself address the issue of truancy? So I think understanding what's underneath the cases not just what we're finding, but if we can put programs or services in place, will that then result in the child going to school on a regular basis versus just to be to, 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 to respond um, to a one-time situation? So we do think it's really valuable to inform all of, all of the strategies. I'll have more on the second round. Mr. Catania. <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Donald. Um, so you about 35 percent of the cases are substantiated, which at this point is about 434 more or less uh, children that you've substantiated educational neglect. We can differ on what that definition is, but I, I think that in and of itself demonstrates that th this initiative which came from the Council a few years ago to require CFSA to engage parents when their children miss 10 days or more uh, is working because we are, even if it isn't perfect, even if every single instance isn't educational neglect, uh, you are able to find those areas that are important. Uh, and I think the, the simple fact that you are coming to visit has had an impact. So anecdotally, is on my school tours, when I invariably when I talk to elementary school principals in particular, and I ask you know, whether or not this law has had an impact, they say <coughs> categorically yes. And so I ask, well, how do the parents react when CFSA calls? And they're very honest about it. They say often the, 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 the family isn't thrilled that CFSA has come okay. knocking. He said, you know, many, the, many times the, the parent or guardians get over it. Sometimes they stay mad. But invariably, they continue to bring their children to school because they don't want another call. And so I, I think that, you know, it's, uh, again, it's too early to say uh, with certainty to quantify how successful the program has been, in part because our definition of truant changes from one year to the next. It's hard to know if you're comparing apples to oranges or apples to apples. 
But I have looked at the data from last school year and this school year thus far. So, you know, we still have three or so months left in the school year. And I see in our elementary schools, as a direct result of increased enforcement of the council-led action to require CFSA visits, there have been really historic declines in truancy. Uh, and I look, I'll just mention a few examples. Amadon Bowden, which last year, by the way, Amadon Bowden is nearly a third bigger this year than last year. 31% of the children uh, at the conclusion of last school year had missed, 31% uh, had missed 21 days or more. Um, at this point in the school year, it is, it is 4%. So again, there are more days of the school year. There's a more of an opportunity to miss, but when you look at the number of kids who are in the 11 to 20, they're going to have to start missing weeks at a time at this point to catch up. So that's one example. Bancroft is another example. Last year, 8% or 29 kids had missed 21 days or more. This year, zero. In fact, they've only had one uh, student that has missed more than 11 days out of a school that has 100 more students. Uh, Brightwood is an example. You know, went from 6% to zero. Brookland, 10% to zero. Brown, 28% to five. And these are the number with 11 or more. Burville stands out. Uh, last year, 38%, 102 of the children uh, at the conclusion of the last school year had missed 21 days or more, 38%. That is now 3%. And in fact, where they had, where they had 102 kids that had had 11 or more complete uh, unexcused absences, that number is 11. These are rather dramatic. And, and I having, you know, this is one of the many schools I've attended. Another perfect example uh, is, uh, is Cook, dramatic reductions. Davis from 36% to 7. Elliot Hine from 27% to 1. Faraby Hope from 17% to 5. Francis Stevens from 32% to 1. Garrison from 15% to 4. Uh, Harris from 48% to 6. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, naturally, there are a couple of more months left in school. But when you, when you break the data down, and it's hard to do it in this setting, these, the kids will have to start missing a lot more to be on track. And so it tells me, again, if we're comparing apples to apples, and we don't know if we are, mm -hmm. it may just be that this, this, this consequence of not having your child in school is starting to register. And, and, and that is anecdotally fitting in with what I'm hearing on most mornings in elementary schools, because this is absolutely a question I ask every morning. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me the parents often don't like it. Sometimes they stay mad, sometimes they come with an attitude, but the kids are coming mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. So now whether or not this model works for 14 to 17 year olds, it remains to be right. seen, and that's the subject of ongoing discussions. And I want to thank you for your willingness to engage, as well as the Attorney General and the Deputy Mayors. I think this has been very constructive. I mean, it isn't easy to solve these problems, right. and it requires listening to one another mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, in my opening remarks, I, cl I, I described where I believe we stand by way of our negotiations on the Attendance Act. Um, what, what part of that did, did I get wrong in your view? No, I, um, I was looking at the rough flow chart that we walked you through the other day, and I think those agreements were made as, as far as reducing the number of days for referrals for the older kids, the follow-up with the MPD letter MPD and letter. A, a subsequent letter. Okay. And so I think that's where we're, we, we feel like we're on common ground there. Well, hopefully we'll have another one, one round. There remains one outstanding issue on how to resolve between at least me as a chairman of the committee and the executive, and hopefully we can explore that more and get closer sure. and, 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 and move to the next issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kitanya. Mr. Grasso. <coughs> oh, Mr. Berry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, let me welcome Brenda Donald to this part of the hearing. We sat for eight, <laughs> nine hours uh, a couple of days ago, and I said then, I say now, you inherited a mess of a department, and you brought to us skills that are necessary to try to solve some of these problems. You grew up in Ward 8, and so uh, we're very proud of that in terms of understanding on the ground what things are. He went to the uh, state of Maryland and came back. We appreciate you coming back. And uh, you have been a good administrator, good Thank department you. head. Now, on the other hand, let me uh, ask about what happens. There were how many? 800 and some report? Yeah, 1,240 now. 1,240. Mm -hmm. What happens once you get that report? Right. 
We get the report, and then we go through our hotline you know, risk assessment, and we decide whether or not the case needs to have a traditional investigation. So that's a real serious risk that we think, in addition to the child not going to school, maybe mom has substance abuse or mental health issues, or there's a prior report. We know the family, so that would be elevated to a higher level, and we would go do a traditional investigation. If the child has missed school and other factors seem to you know, be relatively I'm, low, I'm, we I'm do a an assessment. Running, I got that part. Okay. Out of the 434 cases out of the total referred, would you say these are serious cases? The ones that have been substantiated? Yeah. No. I mean, the, the cases that have been substantiated typically have other complicating issues. So it's not just that they're not going to school. Let me ask you another question. By the time you get a report, go to the hotline, do all these risk assessments, mm -hmm. how long does that take? We, I mean, huh? we go out within 24 hours. You finish it in 24 hours? No. We initiate it in 24 hours. We have up to 30 days to finish it. But In the meantime, while you're doing that, the young person between five and and uh, thirteen mm -hmm. could still be out of school, wouldn't? It? Could yes. Which means it's not, Mr. Catania, just ten days. Mm -hmm. It could be fifteen days. It could be twenty days. Could be yes. I think we've got to find a way, Mr. Catania and Mr. Mendelson, a way to figure out how we fairly quickly sort out those that are not substantial mm -hmm. and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Because I I have a real problem. I'm for 10 days. I'm not for 25 days. Right. Uh, I'm for program, programmatic movement uh, as well as consequential movement. And so we see right now that there's a serious system problem that we've got to try to get at. Right. Right? Right. And if I could point out in the Chancellor world, the schools, of course, have a series of things that they do immediately when a child is, is un, has an unexcused absence. We're starting with a phone call, a, a home visit, letters a team meeting, all of these things precede their referral to us. So it's not that the child is not in school and nothing happens for 10 days. It's exactly. only at, the, at the middle school level and high school level, this is not working. Right. Well, that's a because in a lot of low-income communities, they change phone numbers right. every other month for right. a lot of reasons. One, they're involved in some things that they don't want people to call them about. They don't want credit, et cetera. So this is a very serious situation mm -hmm. that the system got to look at. Mm -hmm. And so you made a case, uh, from my view, it had to be raised to a higher level where the city administrator can order certain things to happen if you have to do that. Now, in terms of the cases, once you investigate, once you find some corrective action, what's your feedback on whether or not if you refer it to a collaborative, right. which is overloaded already, I just tell you that Ms. Henry talked about that. What's your feedback me mechanism? Well, the collaborators are supposed to report back, but the families. No, wait um, yeah. a minute. Yes, they, have, they report to us on a on a on a regular basis, a monthly basis. They have contact What's regular? with us. A month. Yes. Which means you already got twenty days out of school. Right. Then you got another thirty days on mm -hmm. top of it, and these kids been out of school twenty five. They could. Thirty days. Right. We all know educationally, if they've been out for right. ten days. It's a problem. Certainly 25 days, they're so far behind, they can't catch up probably unless they bring it. And some of them have other kind of problems. And so what the point I'm making here, this elevated task force mm -hmm. needs to bring in experts who know a lot about this and try to help you all with filling these gaps. Mm -hmm. Because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel if you don't have to. Again, I want to, uh, do we have another round, Mr. Chairman, or the last round? Um, well, yes, because okay. they have a second round. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Um, let me see. We, we were kind of finishing up on a point about um, the usefulness of the data. Okay. I certainly don't want to be critical of data because I think data is always important, but its usefulness can vary. We do need to know how much of the problem is transportation so we know how much money we ought to be putting through the truancy prevention program into transportation assistance. We do need to know how much of the problem is mental health so that we have adequate resources at DME. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you agree with me. But I sometimes think that some folks are just into the data for the data. That Well, let's find out how much D mental health is an issue with truancy. 
And to my way of thinking, we know that mental health is a cause of truancy, so we have to be able to deal with mental health. But beyond that, we don't need to, just for the sake of understanding the problem, know how, how much of it is due to mental health. Right. We're not stopping anything, and we're, we're responding on a case-by-case -case basis. But when you talk about a citywide response, and there are you know, lots of questions and criticism about the task force and the, and the different strategies and programs, we would want to know, well, what really is going to work? And you know, the, the Chancellor report, even in terms of the outcomes for the kids who are referred to CFSA, that are they still going to school? We're going to find that a lot of them are not. And so is our response an effective one? It's an effective one from a CFSA standpoint because we have a chance to go in and see if a child is safe, which is our primary responsibility. And then, of course, we want to try to figure out what we can do to help the child go back to school, but that's not necessarily a, a, a causal relationship, and, and you'll see that data. And the, um, the schools that uh, Chairman Catania um, reported about with the reductions, I'm really anxious to, to, to see that data and then compare what referrals we got from those schools and whether those kids went back to school. Because that's, so that's the whole point. We want to make sure that what we're doing is an effective response and that it is really moving the needle in terms of getting the kids back to school. So, How much uh, is stigma still a factor in all of this? And by that, um, you know, a year, when we had the hearing in July, there was testimony that uh, some schools are hesitant to report because uh, a stigma associated with the Child Welfare Agency, um, you, you understand that that's been an issue. Yeah. How much is it still an issue? I think we've pushed past that. I mean, um, and the Chancellor can report on that, but We've got you know, really good working relationships with the schools at multiple levels, and we just had a meeting uh, three or four weeks ago again at the um, principal's leadership group where we met with them and we're talking over the issues and sharing. So I think we're in a, in a real different place, and, um, but the Chancellor can report. And, and you really believe that we're now up to 90 percent um, compliance? That would be uh, school officials reporting uh, kids under the age of or up to the age of 13, 13 who are 10 or more days absent? That's what I understand and that's, you know, again based on the school's central process of um, looking at the students who, who meet that truancy th threshold and then comparing it against the referrals that are made to CFSA. They do that with the schools and then they circle back to us and so that's where we are. And, so know, that data really comes more from DCPS than you? It, it's the both 90%. of us because it's DCPS and then they compare the kids who were truant with the ones that were referred to us, and then we see the delta. Okay, now you would get a measure, though, of whether there's still a, some stigma uh, from pushback, if any, from the uh, families when you go and uh, talk to them. You have differentiated response, so you don't show up with the sheriff and, <laughs> and guns drawn. You, right. you show up in a much more uh, sensitive way. Right. Um, so are you seeing less pushback when you show well, up? Well, first of all, we don't always show up with the differential response because sometimes it does rise to the level of a regular investigation. Um, I mean, families never like us knocking on their door. Let's, let's be honest about it. We're, you know, there's always fear and, and concern when Child Protective Services shows up. Um, but we do try to engage families, and our goal is not to remove a child. It is to find out what's going on and to try to provide or link them up with services. So. Um, so that level of stigma, stigma probably always you know, stays, but um, I think the, the concern before the issue was that the schools were anticipating um, damaging their relationships with parents if they were you know, referring to CFSA because then they get to be the bad guys. But they're following the law, and I think the results are clear that we're not bringing kids into foster care. We're finding out what's going on, what's going wrong. We're trying to provide services and support. So, I mean, I, I think it's generally people understand and people know that they're supposed to send their kids to school. I have two last questions. Um, is uh, information sharing between your agency and others with regard to chronic truants as good as it, as it needs to be? Yes. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, we have access and we share data and I don't have any needs there. Do you see the need for any changes to the law? As far as information sharing? Whatever. Um, I don't think so, no. Okay. Mr. Catania? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The last issue uh, as it relates to the uh, Attendance Accountability Act concerns uh, the suggestion by those of us on the Council that we, just as we refer children from 5 to 13 uh, who have 10 unexcused absences of CFSA, that we 
take that model just for ease and consistency of administration and acknowledging that all children are children all the way to the age of 17. Uh, and this is, candidly, in my view, it's a Benita Jacks defense model because we have literally thousands of kids who are 14 to 17 who are out of the system and we don't know where they are. They've simply fallen through the cracks, right? And right now there's no mechanism to bring them back. There are just none. And so the idea that if the child stops attending school, that CFSA with a differential response has a low-impact home visit to find out where is the child and, and what is the strategy to get the child back on track, I happen to believe is still the, the superior strategy at this point, but I'm open to your suggestions, uh, uh, Ms. Donald. If not CFSA performing that function, who should perform that function? Well, um, I'll go on the record again. I mean, our, my opinion, CFSA's opinion, and the administration's is that it should not be CFSA for the older children and that they, the, the theory behind sending the um, referrals for younger children is that when younger children are chronically truant, that it's a family issue and that a child could be at harm. For older kids, we do, in about 20 percent of our referrals, are older kids. I mean, we have mandated reporters or a neighbor. We get teenagers referred to us all the time for educational neglect, just not routinely. Well, Ms. Donald, what would be the home. harm? Let's start there. What would be the harm? Just as you've got a differential, differentiated response, what would be the harm on these children to simply go knock on the door or call the parent and say, your child's not in school right. and we try to figure out why. Well, I don't know that there would be the harm, but what would be the okay. benefit from our agency that's a Child Protective Services Agency? And so the well, question is, is that going to really benefit the child and the family going back to school or well, having a child? Let's explore that because we don't know. I don't know and you don't know, all right? And, and but what I do suspect, and we have ample evidence that there are plenty of kids who are serving as parents themselves to their siblings, that mm -hmm. there's any, any um, um, unknown amount of abuse or neglect going on in homes, I, and, and children 14, 15, 16, and 17 are still children. I don't see out of an abundance of caution, just as you've identified, that a third of your cases for, for 5 to 13-year-olds are substantiated as educational neglect and worse, that it isn't, it isn't to me impossible to believe that perhaps a third of the kids 14 to uh, 17 fit into that same camp. And I reject the notion that just because they're larger or bigger or that we've grown accustomed to the fact that they act older, that they are, in fact, adults. They are not. And so I, I remain open to an alternative, but the alternative isn't the following, uh, Ms. Donald. The alternative is the present situation where there are thousands of kids who are not in school, who are in this age group. There is no one going to find them, look after them, or try to put them on track. It is an out of sight, out of mind proposition. And I'm looking at the numbers right here. There are thousands of these kids. And so if it isn't the Child and Family Services Administration, and those, every word in that title brings me back to you. If it isn't you, then, then who is going after these kids? Because right now, no one right. is. Right. And so, as you know, we, we have recommended that there would be um, mandated referrals for older kids who reach a certain certain threshold um, in terms of um, absences, but that those would go to a community organization to do the knock on the door or the assessment. My agency is not geared to just do a knock on the door. When we get engaged, we have a legal requirement to do either a full investigation or a full assessment, which is way beyond right. a knock on the door. It's I, a, it's I agree, though, that I'm sorry for interrupting, but at limited time, I think that's exactly where you should be. I don't believe in, in de-escalation de, de, de to mm -hmm. a, perhaps a very effective and very pleasant uh, social services organization, which I will invariably have to train to, to, to handle all of the complexities that they can confront in one of these houses, right? So what might have been a nice volunteer or a nice social worker, I now have to have a PhD or a psychiatrist or a psychologist in these nonprofits, right? So I have to, have to replicate all the talent and capabilities of a full investigation in these nonprofits when I have you to do it. Right. To take off of cases where we have kids of suspected, credible right, suspected well, abuse or neglect. Well, let's, let's just leave it here. What happens to those kids who are six, 14, 15, 16, 17, who drop out now, mm -hmm. who are relegated to whatever future, they are left to their own devices. They have nothing to put them back on track. I want, the, I want an agency like yours, and you are an incredibly competent, able administrator. Part of the reason I want you so badly in this game is the fact that you're good. 
not to mention the fact that it is your agency's mission to go and find out and problem solve in every one of those thousands of cases what is going on. Now that's going to require a lot of work, but the the option is prison. Right. And and, and Councilmember Catania, you know that we have hundreds of kids between the ages of 14 and 21 who are in foster care and, and about 700 and another um, several hundred who are serving in home. So it's not that we are neglecting this part of the population. It's just that if there is a family problem, that is our role. If a kid is delinquent or is making different decisions and a parent has done everything they can to get the kid to school, that's not abuse or neglect. And well, but let's figure we don't that have out. The, we don't even let's, let's figure that out. Let's not just assume can, that all cases are that, are such as you've described. And I'm, not, I'm saying let's not assume that all of them are abuse or neglect. And so that's the well, I'm out of my time. We'll come back to another round. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, uh, Ms. Donald, thank you for your leadership and your tenacity in trying to tackle these problems. Let me just say very clearly where I am. I am unalterably opposed to uh, 14, 17, or 18 young people going to CSFA. You are a child welfare agency. And Ms. Katane, I think what happens with the older young people, their problems are more protracted. It takes a lot more investigation, a lot more placement, a lot more work on it. Uh, for, take for instance, uh, it is very well known that in some instances ADHD is progressive. Uh, in some instances it's not progressive. I'm not an expert in that area. But I am opposed to it. Now, what do we do? We ought to, as a, as a government, try to figure out the best place to go. I would be opposed to that sending them to these community-based organizations because there's not enough accountability there. You don't know what's going on over there. I needed to go to a government agency, which continue, that you can hold accountable for receiving these young people and not leave them out in the desert like they are now. Ms. Kane, you're right. Nothing is happening. These kids are just out here. Uh, we have homeless young people in that category. Uh, we talked about that at our mm -hmm. hearing. So the issue is not because this won't work. Let's put it over here. Let's think about it. Let's, let's go get around the country, see how other people are doing it in terms of the same population of people. I'm not talking about going to Montgomery County and finding out how they do it. We don't have a similar population. So I think it would be very clear. I want to work with everybody, Mr. Daniel you included, Mr. Benson, on trying to find some way to, to satisfactorily and effectively deal with these young people. For instance, uh, in terms of older young people, you know and I know that a lot of these older youth are out of control, out of control of their parents, out of control of their guardians, out of control of their foster parents, and et cetera, whereas I think for younger young people, you don't have it as relevant in that area. So I, I would urge you and the administration to, to be stand firm on opposing that, but also come up with a solution right. that works. I'm not so sure court services is the right solution either because the court services is more of a punitive situation than a service situation. So that ought to be high on our agenda. <coughs> what happens to these older young people who are wandering out of here, dropping out of school, uh, who ought to be in school, School attendance law won't work. They don't care a damn about that. They don't care too much about anything. A lot of these young people have lost respect in their, in their, in their psychic for anybody. Don't respect their mothers. Don't respect their grandmothers. This is a, a minority number now, but it's still prevalent out there. Because by the time kids get 14 and 15, uh, there's a break at sixth grade. Same thing is true with, between eighth grade and ninth grade. The chancellor would tell you that's a serious problem. These ninth graders at our high schools are a very serious problem. David, you've got the largest number of repeat uh, students in there. You've got all these kind of things. So uh, that's an area. Back to, the, back to the collaboratives. And I support those five collaboratives as strong as anybody else mm -hmm. on the committee. They are overloaded already. Ms. Henry testified that I hear the other day that they need more money. Their budget's been cut every year. 
Mr. Graham and I are going to do all we can to restore the money up to a certain level. And so now you're going to take an overworked organization and do it. I have a very specific example. Uh, the deputy mayor had 54 young people that he referred to the Far Southeast Strengthening Collaborative with Perry Moon, who's an outstanding person. But when he came in to testify, when she came to testify, they didn't know what happened to 27 of them. They didn't have any idea what happened to them. And then there were another 10 that had not gotten any positive results from it. So it boiled down to about three or four that had been put into situations that helped them go forward. And so that's why I'm not just for the collaboratives or any organization, community-based organization, there's not enough accountability. The only way you hold them accountable is their contract. Whereas as a government, we have laws that you can hold people accountable to and hold that them. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I am believe in program helping. I'm not for punitive except as a last resort. A punitive doesn't work. A lot of these kids don't care about being, being punished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Grasso. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, were you part of the ta you're part of the task force, right? Yes. Uh, you were. And um, I, I was looking at the strategic goals for the task force, and I noticed that your agency doesn't have any direct responsibilities attached to it. Is there a reason for that, or am I missing right. something? No, because our, our, our responsibilities regarding truancy are mandated by law and by our own um, mission, and that's the educational neglect. And so we didn't see that as a task force strategy. This is just what we're, we're responsible for doing. Okay. Um, so we actually had discussion about that, and we didn't. It's not a did. program or an initiative. This is our work. Do you currently work with the steering committee on any of the issues at all? Or yes. Is your, you do. What kind of stuff are you? Well, the the other role that CFSA has or has had up until this point is that we fund the collaboratives, and so through our contracts with the collaboratives, because the mayor has made um, truancy a, a priority. There were a couple of initiatives that people have heard about, the buyer initiative and the high school one, that the collaboratives were signed on to do, and so we, we let them do those through the contract. So essentially we fund their work. And so I sit in that capacity. Just. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I want to know. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grasso. I have a couple more questions. Uh, one is um, the um, do you have access right now to DCPS's STAR system? Yes, we do. Uh, through an MOU, correct? Yes. Has that MOU has an expiration date? We did, and we renewed it and expanded it. Is your access to STARS adequate? Yes. I mean, we negotiated what we thought we needed in terms of, of our CPS, and we're, we're satisfied, yes. And uh, the negotiation was easy? I think so. My, my staff did it. <laughs> my part was easy. <laughs> okay. Um, with regard to funding the collaboratives, you, you just said you, you fund the collaboratives. The collaboratives are doing some work through... Um, uh, some, um, how do I want to phrase this? The, um, a couple of the collaboratives are, I think we're calling them CBOs with uh, grants that uh, Justice Grants Administration has put out for um, elementary school. You're familiar with that? I'm familiar with that. That doesn't come through our contracts. Those were separate grants. That so that's separate funding to yes. those collaboratives? Yes. Um, how adequate, this may not be the right way to ask the question, um, yeah. As, as we continue to expand our efforts with truancy, is the funding for the collaboratives adequate? I would say not, I would, I would say it slightly differently. The funding to cover all of the kids who need a response for truancy is not adequate. So as we clearly know the work that the collaboratives are doing with, and the numbers have been quoted quite a bit, with the, the five or six middle schools and the high schools are only touching a small number of kids. And so whether it's the collaboratives, another government agency or some other community-based organization, clearly there need to be more dollars put if we're going to reach the, older, the kids who are too well, How do you pay the collaborators? Do you pay them on a per-kid basis? We have, our contracts have um, um, target areas for certain kinds of cases, and so these would be considered community cases. So each collaborative would have funding for X number of community cases, X number of diverted cases. There are three or four categories. And that's what your contracts with them have looked like all along. And so, yes, they have. And so what, for the, the truancy initiatives, we just basically said, so if they had a, a contract for 100 cases, we'd say, well, then they're going to do 20 truancy cases in this school. 
then those would be 20 cases they wouldn't do as community cases. So those would be the priorities. Or you would have to increase their contract to pay for 120 cases. Correct. Right. Has that been an issue? No, because the initiative has been so small. I mean, that's why we were able to absorb it within the contract. And um, if we were to increase it by, let's say, uh, double the number of cases, roughly, back of the envelope, how much would that cost? I think the Where's estimate the for um, the collaboratives by school was around $60,000 because it's basically oh, a yes. staff person, and that staff person, a case manager, could handle about 20 or 25 cases. So that, that's the, 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 the budget assumption around this, the, how many kids could be served with the case, the high, the case management model. Yes, I saw that in the budget formulation right. for next year. Uh -huh. uh, so then right now the collaboratives are handling truancy um, in the, the case management and the buyer model. And the high school, yes. Which is, yeah, the case management. They're handling that within the existing contract. Yes. But to increase that, you figure it would cost about $60,000 a school. No, I'm saying based on their budget model, $60,000 for about 20 to 25 families that they're working with. So, you know, you multiply it out. If it's a full coverage for the thousands of kids, I mean, you can factor that out. It would be a costly model. Now, is that the model that would be recommended? I, I don't know. And when will you know? Or I could say, when will we know? Right. I mean, that's that what would the task force supposedly is discussing. The task, right. That come will come back from the task force and back from a proposal from the mayor through in the 14 budget, which will be out in a few weeks. Yes, I'm not sure I'm feeling any more enlightened on that one, uh, Mr. Catania. Uh, just, um, Mr. Chairman, I want to say how much I appreciate Ms. Uh, Donald's work on this front and on other fronts. And you know, you. Uh, uh, I, the reason I you know, am asking is I legitimately want your recommendation on. If you believe your agency isn't well suited, then I need one that is believable. Right. And I continue to be reluctant to embrace this uh, buyer and high school case management program as a model, not to diminish that they do good work, but the combined number of children touched will be 60. Right. And last year, and again, we rely on numbers because numbers can help inform us. There were last year 3,047 kids just in the traditional public schools, to say nothing of the charter schools that missed more than 21 days. And so, you know, we're reaching about 2% of those in need and, and, and ramping it up, doubling it gets me to 4% and still right. isn't really solving yep. the problem. And look, this work is not easy, it's not hard. Uh, I mean, it's not, not easy, it's hard. And that's why we have to continue to stay engaged and, and push ourselves through it. But we took these jobs, and so this is our, our responsibility. Yep. Uh, and my criticism of the task force isn't a criticism of the members, it's the criticism of the sense of urgency coupled with resources that is frustrating me. Um, we have a ninth grade problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is you know, going to segue into my questions for the chairman, uh, for the, the chancellor. We have a ninth grade problem. Um, I think the CFSA interventions and other efforts have done a great uh, service for pre-K through eight. But you know, we have 29% uh, of our <coughs> ninth graders last year missed uh, 21 days or more, 29%. And it happens to equal the percentage of kids who failed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, you will hear me talk about this mm -hmm. a lot. Um, according to our law, only third, fifth, and eighth graders in the District of Columbia can be held back. We are required to push a fourth grader through who cannot read, and a fifth grader who cannot read, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, a sixth grader who cannot read, and a seventh grader who cannot read. And so the inertia of the system pushes kids who are not ready for ninth grade, it pushes them through. and. At ninth grade, they hit the first time there are any requirements. They have to pass an English class and an algebra class to go on to, to become sophomores. And then they can't. And so they start hitting an abundance of failure. And I mean, this is, this is a graph that shows you the numbers are perfect correlation. The percentage who miss school are the, equal to the percentage who are failing. And so while we tweak that and stop that mm -hmm. process, and again, it's offering kids summer school and better interventions to make sure they're on grade level, we got to solve the problem we have, and we have a ninth grade problem. So, I, I'm open to a ninth grade solution as an okay. intermediary pr problem. But I, I want to, I want I need you to work with me, though, uh, Ms. Donald. I need, I need there to be some reciprocity in this. I need you to give me a plan on how we reach these ninth graders, and it may be some very serious uh, intergovernment work with DCPS, with mandatory summer school, and a whole host of other things. Mm -hmm. There are a lot, there's there are a lot of things being away here until we can work this out of our system. 
Um, you know, these are not uniform, easy solutions. There are lots of things being away. Transportation costs a lot of them. But I, it just strikes me as the numbers are too elegant. They, they align too closely. The time the child starts hitting failure is the time the child starts checking out. Uh, but uh, I think we can solve this problem. I don't want to end this all doom and gloom. I think we can solve it. The city, we, are, we, are, we, we have the resources. We're sitting on a nice surplus. We just had a, a, you know, an increase in the revenue projection. And we have to make a decision, you know, a moral decision about whether or not we are going to invest in saving mm -hmm. these kids or not, or whether or not we will continue to do the daisy chain of excuses right. about it's my job to pick up pencils, not pens. We have to pick them up both, yep. right? And it's uh, my responsibility, the chairman's and Mr. Berry's and Mr. Grosso's, to give you the resources and support that you need to do this. But I don't want you to, th to think, and I don't want anyone watching this thinking that, uh, you know, I don't have complete confidence in your agency and you. I have an abundance. And I want you engaged. And if you can't do it, I want I want to be I want to be flexible and work with you to help construct what will work. Because the last thing that does me any good is to get seven votes and get something through, right. and have malicious implementation or have a lack of resources yeah. or whatever, Definitely. right? But let's just start talking honestly about that about the situation, and let's stop giving up on these kids. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any further questions from members? Mr. Yes, Barry? sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barron. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree 99% with Mr. Catania in terms of the analysis. We cannot give up on these kids. We cannot give up on any of these kids. Many people have given up on them. Their parents give up on them. The community gives up on them. The schools give up on them. The council members give up on them. And we've got to stop that cycle, David. You and I both agree that that is egregious to have happen, particularly in this community where we're sending black boys to the dump heap every day, the jail, criminal justice system. And so on one point I do disagree with Mr. Catania. Uh Ms. Donald, I don't think it's your job to figure out what's happened to the Ninth Streeters. That's not your job. That's not what the welfare agency is about. I think it's the mayor's job, Mayor Gray, Mr. Gray job to put together a plan in his administration to deal with these ninth graders. And the problem is more serious than that, uh, David. You find that these ninth graders are the most disruptive when they get into a <coughs> high school. At any high school they go to, they're most disruptive. Then they fall, drop out. If you're not in school, how can you learn anything? So it doesn't surprise me that the numbers of those who are not in school parallel those who are uh, held back. And it's even more serious than that, Mr. Catania, because we don't have a system in our high schools. I'm going to talk to the Chancellor about it. I have talked about this. You have feeder schools that are elementary schools. There's no way to, to gauge which elementary school pre prepares the young people better than other high schools. Mm -hmm. We had a school in Ward 8. Uh, it's gotten better this year, but not much. The 12 percent is Stanton Elementary. They're now 18 percent. Then they sent to Kramer, uh, which has 16 percent, 17 percent proficiency. So it becomes a vicious cycle where we send people into failing situations. The chance and I agree we're going to do all we can, and the members of the council agree, to try to get these schools where there's a quality seat in every community, in every neighborhood. And people don't have to have to go out of bounds to do that. So I want to. Uh, just make myself clear. I don't think it's your responsibility uh, to do that, ninth grader. It's your responsibility to do the best you can. You work off the heart to take care of these five to 13 year olds in terms of education neglect. And it may be that your agency is not the proper place for your education neglect. I don't know. I know that you're working hard at it. Again, I go on results. This time next year when we have this hearing, we're going to come back with a drop in truancy, a drop in other kind of problems, a drop in suspensions, a drop in all these kind of things. And the chairman and I uh, agree, both chairmen, on in-school suspensions. To drop these kids off at one of our public schools with truant, they just get caught up in there. You ain't got but one uh, truant officer to take care of all these problems. It's not the solution. I've talked to Mr. Sanders about this, the president of the teachers' union. 
how can we get teachers to have the same attitude? We're not going to let these kids fail. Now, many of them do. Many of them don't. How are we going to get these teachers to join us in home visits uh, so we can see the conditions of these people? How are we going to get these council members to join us and go into these homes? Come on, sit beside you, work with you for a day to see how hard it is that's going on. Just because of hard, I mean, we shouldn't do it, right. but it gives us a degree of difficulty uh, that we ought to look at. So uh, uh, these, are, these are huge problems that no one has solved successfully in a urban situation. I was talking with the chancellor. He said, nobody has done this. I said, you're right. That means we shouldn't do it, and she wants to do it, too. So uh, I've enjoyed this uh, session. We had a great session the other day. It just lasted too long. <laughs> but my, you know, I just celebrated on the 20th of February my new kidney, a four years kidney transplant. And so my kidney from time to time caused me to have to leave the ticket. <laughs> well, it's a great thing. I had 18 years of cancer free from prostate cancer. And God has blessed me to do that, 76 years of age. And so we care deeply about this community like you do like all the members of this yeah. council. We may differ on how you get there, but we all agree we ought to get there. And I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you, uh, you. Ms. Donald. Uh, Kai Henderson, if you could come forward, Chancellor of D.C. Public Schools. Anybody want to join us, as long as it's not more than three total? I'm going to swear everybody in before you sit down. If each of you would raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the counsel you're about to give, the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia, Committees on Education and Committee of the Whole, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. You answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Yes. <coughs> Chancellor, would you identify who's with you at the table? Yes. Um, on my left, I have Stephen Jackson, who's the principal of Dunbar Senior High School. On my right, I have Adele Fabricant, who is our deputy chief for the Office of Youth Engagement. Okay, and when you're ready, please. Super. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Mendelson. Is it morning? Afternoon, sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Council Member Katania, and members of the committee. I want to thank you once again for helping to draw our attention to the important issue of student truancy. With your help, we've made a great deal of progress in recent months. Today I want to spend some time updating you on the progress that we've made to date in implementing the truancy interventions that we discussed over the summer. I also want to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned as we examine our truant population. Finally, I want to devote some time to the work that we're doing in schools, which, while not directly related to truancy, is the real key to ensuring that our students are invested in and successful in our schools. If you, there is a, um, a slide deck that you have a copy of. I apologize that it is not in color, um, but we tried to show you kind of red, green, and uh, red, green, and yellow, which is how we mark our progress uh, on some of this stuff. Yes, um, I know, gray, gray, and gray, so my apologies. Um, but we can get you colored copies. Um, so let me just talk through this quickly. Um, DCPS is implementing eight measures intended to address truancy that we talked about in July. Um, this slide provides brief updates on each of those. Um, as I've said in previous testimony, last year DCPS did an inadequate job referring truant students to CFSA and to the court system. Last year we only referred 21% of eligible 5 to 13 year olds to CFSA and 8% of eligible 14 to 17 year olds to, CF to court social services. I'm pleased to report that these figures are much better this year. As of last week, we had referred 93% of eligible students to CFSA and 42% of eligible students to court social services. There's still much room for improvement, particularly for the teenage students, and I'm committed to increasing these figures. We've successfully implemented two, so that's yellow in our world, sorry. 
Um, <clears throat> we've successfully implemented two programs which specifically address high schools with the highest truancy rates. We expanded the case management model from two to seven high schools, and we added social workers to each of the high schools that produced the greatest number of truant students. To address the needs of students in middle grades, we're implementing the truancy court diversion program in five schools, which is also known as the buyer model. Um, we've also established and trained student support teams at all of our schools to ensure that staff is identifying and addressing student needs before truancy becomes chronic, as we agreed upon in July. We've made progress in tracking root causes of truancy through our student information system. Um, we have a lot more work to do to ensure both the quality of that information and the comprehensiveness of it, um, but we have significantly more information than ever before about why students are missing school. I'll return to this issue shortly. We vastly improved our relationship with CFSA, as you heard from Director Donald, and are working at improving our data sharing so that we can better serve, serve students through both agencies. Finally, uh, we're subsidizing transportation at our high schools with the highest truancy rates. Based on available resources, we're working to expand this program to serve as many students as possible. I'm pleased to report this progress, but I don't measure our success based on program implementation. Instead, we must measure our success based on the actual truancy rates in our schools. And these data give us less cause for optimism. If you take a look at page three, um, you'll see that this year our truancy rate maps very closely to last year's rate. While we had set a goal of reducing tru district-wide truancy from 12% to 9% this year, our current trajectory, shown here as the middle line, since you can't see the light green, um, <clears throat> is only slightly lower than the 6% rate of chronic truants that we had last year through February. Um, because it's black and white, can you try that again? Yeah, sure. So the top line, the 11.8%, um, is was our actual truancy rate for last school year. The uh, nine point one. I'm sorry, with the diamonds. So the the line with the diamonds intersecting them was our last year truancy rate, eleven point eight percent. Right? Oh, Can you yes. see that? Yes. Okay. Then the line on the bottom with the squares, nine point one is where we were trying, this is our goal for truancy for this year, uh, for the end of this school year. And then the line in the middle with triangles, um, which ends in 5%, is our actual right now. So we are just roughly, we're 1% below where we were last year at this time. And what is chronic according to this? Sorry, say it again? What is chronic? You uh, said chronic. 15 days or more. 15 days. Yes. Um, if you flip to slide four, um, it was our sincere hope that while district, while the district-wide truancy rate is still high, that I'd be able to appoint to lots of individual success stories in some of the schools where we've provided the most significant interventions. But as you can see from our high school data, while we've seen some improvement, but successes are limited and inconsistent. Most of the high schools on this chart have received additional social workers as well as case management interventions. While four schools show reductions in the truancy rates, two show increases and two remain constant. We also see no obvious correlation between high referral rates and drops in truancy rates. Some schools with low referral rates have reduced their truancy rates, and some schools with high referral rates have increased their truancy rates. In fact, the one school where I feel confident identifying real improvement is at Dunbar Senior High School, where a Twilight Academy program has helped individual students who fail classes make up the coursework during special afternoon and evening sessions. The program is in its first year, but shows real promise as a model for helping students catch up to their peers rather than becoming distanced from the school when they're not successful. There's also a systematized approach to contact with families before the students come tr become truant. And you'll hear more about that uh, when Mr. Jackson shares his testimony. You leave uh, uh, slide four. Yep. Truancy LYTD. Last year to date. And that's a percent. 
Yes. Okay, so then... Um, and then the next, um, the next column is this year to date, so a same time comparison. Um, so at Anacostia, effectively, the rate has stayed the same. Um, at Ballou, it's gone up by four points. At Cardozo, stayed the same. At Dunbar, down seven points. Um, at Roosevelt, it is down uh, seven points. Um, okay. Oh, and then the CSS referral compliance, that's a percent? A percent, yes. What percentage of the students eligible? And that's for this year? Yes. All right, thank you. Sure enough. If you flip to slide five um, and six, there is some reason for optimism in our elementary and middle grades, and many of the, the schools that um, Councilmember Catania cited are some of our elementary schools that have been working really hard on this. As you can see from these slides, many schools have seen meaningful reductions in their truancy rates, and most have high rates of referral. Still, these individual successes, while laudable, have only had a small impact on the overall truancy rate across the district. As we contemplate the role of CFSA and CSS referrals in combating truancy, it's important that we look specifically at the students who are referred to determine if referral either serves as a deterrent to future truancy or if CFSA intervention helps address the cause of truancy, allowing a student to again attend school regularly. If you flip to slide seven, <clears throat> the answer is not exactly encouraging. <laughs> Um, we had 309 CFSA referrals between September and December. Um, and what this chart shows you is the amount of unexcused absences after the CFSA referral was made. Uh, we found that 70% of the students who were referred to CFSA had more than three unexcused absences after their referral. More than 30% had 10 or more additional absences. In fact, the case that Mr. Catania raised earlier uh, about the young lady at Deal is actually a case where she wasn't referred at Deal because she had been referred at Sousa before, switched schools, and continued to be absent. Deal contacted CFSA, but they didn't initiate a new case because the case was already open with CFSA. Um, <clears throat> These data point to two conclusions. First, by the time students have 10 unexcused absences, they have a significant challenge with regard to school attendance that can't be solved quickly, even with CFSA's assistance. Second, DCPS and CFSA must continue to improve the process for sharing our data. I strongly suspect that some of these students who were referred have moved or transferred to another school. As CFSA and DCPS continue to improve the feedback loop, we'll be able to better understand the data and eliminate cases where students have moved or transferred to another school. While we're working to address, we are working to address both of these concerns going forward. What do you mean by eliminate the cases? Say it again? What do you mean by eliminate the cases? Well, in some cases, we, if, a, if a kid has moved to a different school and we have not relayed that information to CFSA, they are still attempting to contact the child or are, the absences are still accruing at the school that they were previously at um, because our feedback loops aren't quick enough to get that information to CFSA. So the kid who left Sousa to go to Deal? Different case. But um, they might still have been marked as absent at Sousa. At Sousa, yes. Uh -huh. And to eliminate their being marked as absent at Sousa. Yes. Because they've moved. Yes. On the last slide, um, we have some of the barriers to attendance that we've collected um, in STARS. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, we've been working hard to identify the reasons that students are truant. Our data collection is in the early phases of implementation, so I'm not yet ready to draw broad conclusions. In addition, we have additional work to do in training staff and gaining the trust of students and parents so that we can get an accurate, account an accurate accounting of why students are not regularly attending school. As I showed on an earlier slide, we only have root cause data for about 54% of the students who have at least five absences. Based on the available data, however, we can see that student health, academics, and transportation are the three most significant challenges that truants face. It was these data that drove us to expand our transportation intervention. We're looking for similar measures that can address the needs for, of students with health, 
health challenges, and I'm particularly eager to address the academic challenges that lead to unexcused absences. I believe that there are three big conclusions that we can draw from what we've learned so far. First, referrals to CFSA and CSS are a very useful tool as we work to combat truancy, but referrals are not the solution. We'll continue to push our referral rates up, but evidence does not indicate that this is that this is helping to reduce truancy at this point overall. The data that we have simply don't yet indicate that CFSA and CSS referrals are a deterrent to truancy. I believe that referrals should serve as one means of sharing information between agencies. CFSA can access information about a student's home life that's more comprehensive than that which DCPS can access. This information can help connect students to social services and can also help DCPS identify students who move or transfer to other schools, who need help as a parenting student, or who could be better served at a different school program. Our interaction with CFSA continues to develop, but we've made great progress towards this goal. At the same time, as Councilmember Katania mentioned earlier, we're beginning to explore the option of having um, the Metropolitan Police Department reach out to students with 10 unexcused absences. Based on the causes of truancy that we've seen, I'm not sure that the threat of MPD involvement will change most families' behaviors, but we're hopeful. Um, however, I'm committed to using every tool at our disposal to, in an effort to increase student attendance. Second, I believe that after a student misses 10 days of school, it's very hard to get that student back on track to regular attendance. I've instructed my staff to ensure that we are implementing DCPS protocols and processes to begin making contact with the student's home after one, three, and five unexcused absences. The continued absences we've seen after CFSA referrals make me believe that early intervention is the key to getting students back on track. Third, we have some information on what is working and we have to build upon that. The program that we've seen as most effective in reducing year-over-year -year truancy rates is Dunbar High School's Twilight Academy. This program requires students who fail a class to attend a separate program geared towards getting students back on track. I'm very compelled by this program for three reasons. First, it attacks what we believe, what we all believe, is one of the primary causes of truancy, and that's academic failure. It attacks it head-on. Second, the program fits the needs of individual students. Rather than simply making students take the same class again over or repeating a grade again, the Dunbar Twilight Academy provides a new environment in which a student might be more successful. Finally, I like the program because we're already seeing results. 5% more students passed all their classes in the second grading period than in the first, and reading scores are moving up over the course of the school year at Dunbar. This is a success that I'm interested in replicating at other schools. By adding fast-track programs that mirror these advantages, we may be able to change the attendance behavior of our struggling students. Finally, while I'm grateful to the Council for the attention that you've brought to the issue of truancy, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of our larger mission in this conversation. I've spent countless hours thinking about truancy. I've pushed my staff to increase referrals. We've spent hours unpacking data through our regular truancy staff meetings and have monitored the interventions we've put in place. But when I think about really solving the truancy crisis, I believe three elements are critical. First, we have to develop strong, confident, resilient students who can make wise decisions, even under difficult circumstances. Second, we need to engage parents in their students' education well before truancy is ever an issue. And third, we need exciting, enriching, and engaging programming at our schools to appeal to a wide range of students. I want to spend just a quick minute talking about each of these ideas because while they may not yield immediate success, I believe these are the interventions that will improve our outcomes in the long term. And these are the interventions that will truly lead to student success. Beginning two years ago, we intentionally chose a pre-kindergarten curriculum that not only helps students get academically prepared for school, but also <coughs> begins to develop habits of thought, willpower, and self-control that lead to future success. We believe and research has shown that students with determination and grit are able to make good decisions about their own education. This is a long-term project. It can't replace other interventions, but the skills that the tool of the, Tools of the Mind curriculum is giving our students is going to change the conversation we have about truancy as our young people progress through their education. We know that parent engagement works. We've seen it over and over again. When we invite parents to participate in their students' education, they're more invested, more knowledgeable, and more able to partner with us to help their students succeed. We have many examples of this, but one of our clearest is our, is our Flamboyant partnerships. Last year, four schools received training through Flamboyant on how to conduct home visits and how to engage parents in database discussions of student success. At all these schools, we saw big increases in parent involvement, decreases in truancy rates of as much as 4%, 
and gains in student outcomes. We're expanding these partnerships for the upcoming school year, and I'm excited that more parents are going to hear directly from teachers about student progress and hope this means many fewer phone calls to talk about student attendance. I had the pleasure of going on a home visit um, with some teachers from Jefferson Academy earlier this week, and I will tell you that teachers are thrilled, Council Member Barry, to go on home visits, and we're going to equip them with the tools that they need to be successful in that endeavor. Finally, the conversations that we had around school consolidation has led me to think deeply about what connects students to their schools. Like many of you, I was lucky enough to attend a high school where kids could play sports, participate in plays, play an instrument, learn languages, and explore future careers. A school with all those opportunities can be truly diverse. It attracts a diverse group of students and it allows students to explore diverse skills. We are working towards offering students in DCPS these kinds of opportunities. We have a great deal of work to do, but we will show clear progress towards this goal in the upcoming school year. Whether it, it is the confidence that a student feels when singing in the school choir, the burning desire to play drums, or the fascination with learning a new language that encourages a student to come to school, I believe these opportunities are our best tools in reduce, reducing truancy. We will continue to rework and revise our truancy protocols. We are eager to work with you, Councilmember Catania, um, to find an approach to truancy that both provides parents with assistance in combating the challenges that poverty presents and provides clear consequences for allowing their student to be truant. At the same time, I want to make sure we focus on developing student skills, engaging parents, and, proving, and providing a rich academic experience as a long-term solution for our truancy crisis. Through the work this year, we've learned some important ways that our sister agencies can support our work by removing barriers such as transportation, childcare, and housing for our most vulnerable children and families. We've also learned about some things that don't necessarily work so well. But moving forward, while we continue to ensure compliance to the law, DCPS will focus our efforts on changing academics and changing school culture. We'll expand Twilight and Fast Track and alternative programs to put struggling students in a different environment where they can get the academic interventions they need to get back on track. And we'll make schools more compelling places where kids would rather be than in their homes or on the streets. These are, in our professional opinion, the best levers to reduce truancy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Henderson. Uh, we'll be uh, five minute rounds, and there'll probably be a number of them. Um, can I actually let um, Mr. Oh, yes. Jackson testify before yes. we do questions? Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, Chairman Mendelson, Chairman Catania, Councilman Barry, and Councilman Grosso. I am pleased to bring testimony on behalf of Chancellor Henderson and the District of Columbia Public Schools regarding Dunbar's effort to reduce truancy. Over the course of the past two years, Dunbar has worked tirelessly to ensure that all students have the greatest potential to maximize instructional time and succeed socially, emotionally, and academically. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, truancy is the number one challenge in urban education. If the students are not in the school building, then we, educators, public servants, moms and dads, friends and neighbors, had failed them in the most basic way. If the students are not in the school building, then they have no access to instruction, no matter what the quality. If the students are not in the school building, then they have no access to educational resources, no matter how outdated or scarce. If students are not in the school building, then they are not being educated. Without an education, they are doomed to perpetuate the vicious cycle of social ills we are charged with addressing in the first place. At Dunbar, we work relentlessly to address the issue of truancy. While we have made noteworthy improvements, we will not rest until every student attends every class on time every day school is in session. In my humble opinion, nothing short of this is acceptable. To meet this end, we have employed various strategies, all of which I'm happy and proud to share with my fellow educators and public servants. I imagine if it works for Dunbar students, it may work elsewhere. The most important thing in addressing truancy is school culture. If the students do not enjoy school, if they do not have positive relationships with staff and their peers, then who can blame them for disengaging from school? At Dunbar, we have worked hard to make sure that every student feels welcome. We are a family, and every child in our building is confident 
that the adults charged with their care are trust, trustworthy, compassionate, and competent. For my part, every morning, no matter the weather, I greet my students before they enter the building with a kind word and a handshake. I know that for many of them, this is their first pleasant interaction of the day. It is also critical that the instructional program is designed not only to provide students with academic rigor, but to accommodate their social needs as well. When the school cannot adapt to the challenges each student brings to the table, it becomes yet another static fixture in the child's life, another immovable object with which he or she must contend. This is why we created our highly successful small learning communities called academies. Our ninth grade leadership academy houses all incoming first time ninth graders. Our 10th grade academy is for first time 10th graders. These two students groups benefit from an extended school day and a coordinated set of enrichment activities designed to ensure they make a smooth and healthy transition into the high school setting, both academically and socially. This approach has brought us significant gains in attendance, pass fail, and matriculation rates for both grade levels. As we all likely know, many students come through our doors that have already gotten off on the wrong foot in high school. Many of them in their late teens with no more than a half a dozen credits. Many of them have been truant since elementary school. Shoving these students back into a traditional comprehensive day program rarely changes the narrative. This is why we created our Twilight Academy. We wanted a program that was flexible enough to address some of the most extreme challenges our students present. However, we wanted to ensure we weren't creating an alternative program that only served to separate these students from our larger student body as if they were contagious. We wanted a program that would provide a clear pathway into the traditional day program. This particular program accounts for the most significant portion of two consecutive years of double-digit reductions in truancy. Our truancy initiative team works aggressively to monitor student attendance, maintain accurate records, enforce DCPS attendance policies and municipal regulations, support students with excessive absences, provide incentives, communicate with families, coordinate with community partners, and report truant students to the DC Superior Court. Their combined efforts are the cornerstone of our success. They make sure all teachers submit attendance for every class period every day, that parents are contacted by phone every time their child is absent without an excuse. And that certified letters are sent to the homes of students with excessive absences. In extreme cases of absenteeism, members of our truancy intervention team get in their cars and visit homes to talk to parents and students on their turf about the importance of education, support services available at the school, and the potential legal consequences for parents of truant students. It is only after our team has exhausted all available means of intervention that our attendance counselor assembles truancy referral packets and seeks the support of the courts. Our team has benefited immensely from the continued support of the Office of Youth Engagement. Their involvement has been critical in our understanding of attendance data and the productivity of our community partnerships. Still, more resources are needed to improve upon what is already in place. We need more compelling incentive programs. We need to provide reliable transportation for team members conducting home visits. We need marketing dollars to raise public awareness. And this way, we would be investing our resources where it counts, getting our kids back in school. In closing, I assure you that my colleagues and I work tirelessly every day to create welcoming, engaging school environments for district students and to contribute to DCPS becoming the highest performing urban school district in the nation. We take very seriously the critical subject of attendance and truancy prevention. And we appreciate the support of the City Council as well as our city agency and community partners to sustain and enhance our efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I would be happy to answer any questions you have about our work to address attendance and reduce truancy at Dunbar. Thank you. Uh, thank you each of you for your testimony. Um, and again, five-minute clocks. Uh, let me see. Um, 
Chancellor Henderson, uh, the issue of transportation. The, uh, there's some dollars that have become available through the uh, Deputy Mayor's office. Are you the one to ask about the implementation of that program? Yes. Okay. It hasn't been implemented. We just received the money. Um, Is your microphone on? We just, we just began distributing the subsidies last week because we just got the money. Okay. Was it your fault that you didn't get the money till no. now? No. The money was the money had to be dispersed to us from the deputy mayor for education. Okay. Costs. There were some MOUs required. Say it again. There were some MOUs required. Yes. Yes, there was. The MOUs between? Between um, DCPS and the DME's office. Okay. So you had a role in that. I'm sorry? You had a role, you being DCPS, had a role in that. Yes, we did. Why didn't this happen? I saw a timetable for November 19th was going to be the um, the um, fair media getting out. We're way behind that schedule. We are behind. Um, we, we were working with the DME's office closely to negotiate the terms of the MOU, and part of it involved establishing what documentation was going to be necessary to document it properly. I think I'll come back to this in a minute. I um, think there's a case management system for uh, in the high schools. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about, Chancellor? Yes. Are you the one to talk to about that, or is that CJCC or a different entity? It's the collaboratives are managing the case management, the high school case management program. Adele can provide some information but on it. But who is managing the collaboratives? The uh, CFSA case? is managing the collaboratives. So I should actually have asked this question of Ms. Donald? Potentially, if you want to ask the question, we'll tell you what we know. What do you know? We we know that there um, that there have there are 58 participants as of last week. Um, we are monitoring to see how many additional I'm sorry how many additional absences those students are accumulating, that kind of thing. Do you want to know what actually happens when folks? Well, are actually, for I think what I'm trying to do because we're on five minute rounds is to get a sense of what I should be asking you about as opposed to asking CJCC for example or the deputy mayor who's not on the witness list um, as you know Chancellor my view has been that uh, what what I think DCPS needs to do first and foremost is identify the kids who are chronically truant yep. and um, uh, but we have some other initiatives at work like yep. transportation and uh, so to what extent are you the one that I look to for that? Well, I mean, I think we are, we end up being the locus of, of, of service, right? We have the children, um, but uh, we don't, we actually don't manage all of these programs. So we don't manage the buyer yes. program. We can tell you. But who manages, and I know that, so who manages the case management program? The collaboratives manage the case management program and CF CFSA manages the collaboratives. All right, so I should have asked them. And who manages the transportation? We are implementing the transportation pilot now that funds have gotten to us. It's not just last week, so we don't have data yet. Um, we can provide you with data once we get to the 30-day mark to show you whether or not the children that are receiving the transportation subsidy actually have any decrease in their, um, in their uh, absence rate. But we've just started the program because we've just gotten the money. Okay. Um, because I have a minute left, and uh, there will be a second round at least, uh, let, me, let me do this. Um, w what is behind questions that I'll be asking in the second round, and maybe questions that Mr. Catania will be asking in others, is the fact that last year a number of these initiatives were on the table. I have testimony from uh, Ju the July hearing where the deputy mayor testified about how we're going to expand case management in high school. We're going to expand the buyer model in the middle schools. We haven't done that. How uh, we're going to implement the um, fare cards for those who have the transportation problems. Um, that was discussed in the summer, mm -hmm. and only now are the dollars maybe getting to the kids. Mm -hmm. We can't do another year like this. Mm -hmm. um, I got in trouble at the last. Uh, Truancy Task Force Steering Committee meeting because uh, there was a little bit of tone in the questions I was asking. So I'm I ex articulating some of that here. We, we cannot, we just can't do next year what we've done this year, mm -hmm. which is basically tread water compared to last year. Now, truancy is down. There's some initiatives in the elementary schools 
that are actually separate from what the task force is doing, which mm -hmm. seems to be the last number I saw was 400 kids were reached. But buyers, maybe double digits, case management, maybe double digits. Mm -hmm. um, so, because I have to be mindful of the time since I'm going to hold Mr. Berry to the time. When we come back, and as you answer anybody else's yeah. questions, yeah. how are we going to get, yeah. thank you, have you. Not how are we going to get from this year, which is really the same as last year, mm -hmm. to something system-wide that reaches the 3,103 kids mm -hmm. who are chronically truant? Yeah. Mr. Catania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, the 3,103 3, are the kids who missed 21 days or more last year unexcused. Uh, that's a different definition than they're using. I suspect the number is much greater if you're looking okay. at 15. Uh, Chancellor Henderson, during our November hearing, you stated the following. I'm going to quote back your testimony. You said, kids are not going to school because they cannot do the work. The kids in ninth grade are coming with a third grade reading level. Uh, we do not have anything in place to help these kids. And then you went on to talk about that there would be a, liter a literacy initiative that would be initiated in January. Uh, of uh, this year. Can you describe what that literacy initiative looks like and how many children it is serving today? Yep, we actually have not announced the literacy initiative because we haven't finalized it. I think what we needed to figure out was exactly how do we penetrate the literacy problem. There are four ways that we'll penetrate the literacy problem. The first one is by rethinking how we approach summer school. So um, instead of serving everybody who comes this summer, we will actually serve the children who are behind um, as, as uh, identified by their reading levels. It's a very different approach, um, but we've segmented the number, the children who are behind will serve as many children as we served last year, but there'll be an intense focus in summer school on reading so that we can get as many of these folks back on track as possible. Ms. Chan uh, Ms. Henderson, I need to, again, in the interest of time, reclaim mine. So, so we, we are waiting for this literacy initiative to be rolled out. Uh, do you walk back the words from your testimony in November that says the reason the kids are not coming to school is because they, quote, cannot do the work? No, I don't walk back. Okay. I, d I don't walk right. back from that at all. And I look at this, again, I'm not, we don't have the colored version that you have, that has the root causes of attendance issues. Um, how many children did you do a, an ex interview, or how many did you interview before you came up with this uh, this this pie chart? So there were about 3,400 students. And what is the nature of that uh, review? Um, so basically, the um, this is at the truancy conference at the fifth day when the when the family is asked to come in for the conference, and if they don't, then it's the conference happens at the homes during the home visit. Um, and basically the, the nature of the conversation is to ask students what are the primary barriers that are keeping them from And so do you have this organic data? Do you have the worksheets that produce th these? Yes, Can do. you produce those to the committee? Sure. I'd be uh, interested in seeing them because they don't track with what CFSA is saying. Uh, CFSA, who, uh, who is charged with doing the home visitations uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the individuals that um, were referred, for whom there was a, uh, a CFSA interaction, 74% did not mention a reason for the child not being in school and listed no barriers. And there's a tendency to want to, you know, to, to cling to the idea that there is some specific issue. Now, to be sure, issues of parental health and housing and student health and others were mentioned, but by and large, no barrier. In, a, in other words, they are not mentioning a specific barrier that is keeping the child from attending school. So, and, 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 you know, I think we're operating under, um, you know, an anecdote here and there, and I look forward to seeing each of these uh, uh, 3,500, did you say, interviews? It's about 3,400. 3, okay, well, we mm -hmm. look forward to having them. Uh, and can I just add quickly that no mention of a, of a barrier does not necessarily mean that there's not a barrier. One of the things that we found is that parents won't share the issue with us, um, and we find that when they talk to schools, the people who are directly at schools, they are a little more forthcoming. So, um, Chancellor, I understand. Thank you. Um, so, so just the sum total of where we are, because I'm very much of the opinion where the chairman is. One year later, not much has been done. Uh, I don't buy the excuse that we couldn't work out an M MOU. We're not negotiating a bilateral agreement with China. It's you talking to your peer in the deputy mayor's office and being able to figure out how you put money from this pot
to this pot and we are months into it and you still don't have a single free fare card that we bought last fall available in a child's hand. That is a fail. The fact is we keep retreating back to the systems that we have in place. The buyer model in middle school is reaching seven kids. And this, this much touted high school case management system with all the collaboratives, with all the bells and whistles, Mr. Chairman, we expect to reach 53. So we congratulations, we've reached 60 kids out of the more than 3,000 DCPS and we've carved the charter schools out of the equation at all. And I'm not hearing anything that is giving me any reason to believe that in the next few months I'm going to see historic improvements in this subject. Now, I appreciate Mr. Jackson you being here and I appreciate what you're doing at Dunbar and I was there firsthand to see for myself the, the interest that you have in your children and the way in which you put your arms around these kids. But I'm, I'm frustrated because whether you intended it or not, the testimony is coming across as, well, there's nothing to see here. We're going to do this. And, you know, what we're doing now, we're not sure if it's working. But if you just let us do this, it might work. That is frustrating to me. I've got to be honest with you. I didn't expect to be this frustrated. And I am, I am particularly frustrated right now. And I look forward to the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Catania. Um, Ms. Fabricant. Yeah, on page four of the Chancellor's testimony, she said, we have only root cause data for 54% of students who have at least five absences. And my guess is the 3,400 is the number of kids with five absences. So are you saying 3,400 kids were interviewed, or it was 54% of 3,400 kids? So there were, um, I believe it was about over 6,200 conferences that were held of those conferences. 3,400 students identified barriers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grasso. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I really support the effort to put in these um, student support teams in the schools. I think it's a good way to try to be kind of preemptive in these efforts. And I assume that it's uh, kind of this truancy intervention team is the same style. Is that right at Dunbar? Yes, it yeah. is. Okay. Truancy intervention. And that's the same thing, basically. So. What are the attendance counselors' role in all of these? And also, on November 29th, you had 44 schools that didn't have a team. They had coordinators. Is the attendance counselor the same as the coordinator? How does they play together, and, and yeah. is this organized? Sure. So, um, so this year, the, uh, the attendance committee is considered a pre-student support team process or an intervention. Um, at certain on certain teams the attendance counselor will sit on the student support team uh, but there are various people and it's a diverse group of, of school staff who will sit on a school's student support team so they already have an attendance counselor in our high schools we have we okay. a full-time attendance counselor in our elementary and middle schools there are only attendance designees so someone who has multiple roles are there more teams now in place than there were in the end of November uh, yeah there are a hundred I'm sorry a hundred percent of schools now have, have a team yes so they have a coordinator who's designated and a team and some of them may be called truancy intervention teams or something else they're not all uniform in what they're called they're just whatever the school sets up? It, it basically, people call them different things depending on at what point um, in the truancy protocol it's happening. And so maybe, um, I don't know, maybe uh, if you can talk about it, Mr. Jackson, the, the, the kind of standards that you set for your truancy task force, you know, you, you have this truancy intervention team that could be called a support team but isn't, and what are the standards you set for them? What kind of training do they have? And, and then you can maybe reflect on it too, uh, Chancellor, what the training goes into these to talk about, you know, this kind of support they need or, you know, when the truancy happens. Do you want to start, right. Mr. Jackson? Well, well first and foremost, um, we have uh, staff meetings and we let every staff member know from the teacher to uh, the counselors to uh, social workers, everyone in the building, they are a part of the truancy team because right. All the teachers have to call. The first day that a child is absent, we make a phone call. Like even in the Twilight program, they're supposed to be there by 3.30. By 4 o'clock, if they're not there, then we're calling the house. And that's how we're able to increase it. In addition, um, our attendance counselor, as well as our parent uh, coordinator, as well as our social worker, they do home visits almost on a daily basis, including uh, on Saturdays and 
even on Sundays. So the reality of the situation is is that the whole staff have to buy in is, to is, the whole truancy piece. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you, do you have the Flamboyant Foundation as part of your effort, or are they not in your school? They're not in my They're school. They're not in your school. So, I mean, it sounds familiar. I've met with Flamboyant, and I'm glad you brought them up, Chancellor. I think they're an interesting, great group, and they're doing this thing where they really engage the families in the way that I think helps prevent truancy in the long run, which sounds like what you're doing, too, is you're going into the root cause of this. and. That's the effort that needs to spread, and, and so I'm, I think these support teams, you know, that's kind of their role, I would imagine. But I'm still trying to figure that out. To fig, to, to say that they're in 100% of the schools, I think is great. So I assume that you're tracking the data on this, and you'll know kind of what their results are, and kind of like Mr. Jackson does, he knows if his teachers aren't doing it. That, that that's kind of how we move the ball. It's not just putting them in place, but it's training and then tracking. And can you talk a little bit about that? So I, I'll defer to Adele, but the Office of Youth Engagement actually constitutes the team. So it was Adele's team that made sure that there was a coordinator in place who understood what an SST team is supposed to do, who's supposed to be on the team, and that actually provides training to all of the attendance counselors and all of the folks on the SST team. So I'll And do you Adele. gather data out of their effort? I mean, Yes, we do. So, um, so we have monthly trainings, and actually at this point there are two different content areas that folks are trained on. So... So um, the attendance counselor, for example, would be trained on attendance interventions, and the student support team at this point has different monthly trainings um, that, they will, that they will have. Um, and then each one of those bodies is responsible for documenting their interventions. At this point, in two different places, we're working on streamlining them, because at this point, it's, it's too many different things. It's too many different places. Yes. And um, who collects that data? Is that your office? Yes. And then what do you do with it? Um, so at this point, when we look at DC STARS um, for our attendance interventions to see whether or not we're in compliance as has been a huge focus for us this year, um, making sure that we're making sure that we are um, complying with referrals and conducting the interventions at day five, at day 10, so on and so forth. The student support team actually uses a Google Doc at this point to document every single student who is referred to the student support team, what interventions have been put in place, um, and identifying measures of success to progress monitor over time, every six weeks, actually. Thank you. We also roll it up and look at the, uh, we had our monthly truancy stat, and we review the data across the district. Thank you. Mr. Berry. Thank you very much again. Welcome all of you here. Uh, Chancellor, you know, I've been supportive of you over the period you've been here. Thank you for your confirmation. I have confidence in your struggling to try, try to make the system better. And therefore, I appreciate this testimony uh, in terms of giving us the facts. That doesn't happen too much around here. And I want to commend you for that. Thank you. Uh, commend you for Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson, commend you. Uh, Chancellor, I guess my my question is: There are 17 high schools, I think. Uh, Dunbar is one of them, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar has a glorious history. In the days of segregation, it was an outstanding school. And my question to you: What are your plans to do this at all of our high schools? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> we in fact um, are are looking at a couple of different things. So one is replication of the Twilight program. Um, we actually tried the Twilight Academy program at Baloo a couple of years ago. It was structured not in the appropriate way, and so what, in fact, happened was teachers would teach all day, and then Chancellor, they were required. my time to, is moving. Okay. What plan do you have? Additional Twilight programs, fast-track programs, and alternative schools so that children can come On out. On what time frame? in time for next school year. This coming September. This coming August. September. This we is we also have that. to look we also have to look at how Wait we use our choice and state like programs. About that. Go ahead. Uh, you're telling us that in all of our high schools, our alternative schools, we'll have some variation of the theme, but we'll have the kind of uh, culture change that Mr. Jackson did brought about, which is the culture change all of us want to bring about, where every staff member in that school is part of truancy reduction, not just the principal, not just the teachers. When can we expect it to happen? Well, the culture change that? doesn't actually come from a Twilight program or an alternative Chance, program. You know that, know in that. fact, every, at every single Chance, one of my, answer I, I'm answering your question, at every one of my goal setting meetings with principals this year, we talked about what efforts they would put in place around truancy and what efforts they would put in Madam place Chance, around Madam Chancellor, let me my question. 
when can this council, this city, and this school system expect some variations but the direction that Mr. Jackson has taken us in every high school, every alternative school, well, every special school. We are working to, to make that happen right now. By September? I can't guarantee that that will be in, in place, but that's our hope, sure. Um, but it, takes, it is, takes a talented leader. It takes an aligned staff. It takes the appropriate resources. It, it is a cocktail of things. And Madam we, Chancellor, I think have put the know cocktail I know together. That. And you make the decision about the principles and the leadership. So if they're not like Mr. Jackson, then you get somebody similar to him. Sure. And we go forward. And so we can't expect in September uh, most of this to be implemented in our high schools. Well, just like last year, we had not focused on truancy. We brought in a focus on truancy this year from the top of the organization Madam all the Chancellor, way down, you the which question? has actually improved in the referral rate. I know That's that. Can we, we answer the question? So we'll continue when to work on When can this community, it. when can this school system expect to have similar programs in all of our high school, alternative schools, and special schools? We're, we're, work, we're working no, to accomplish it as quickly as possible. I'm sorry, I can't guarantee you a date. This is not a, a switch that you flipped. You, open, that, you, you got open this up saying no, that this no, is no, a major problem. No, why can't you say that we'll get back as we sit more, get more time and looking at it, see what the resources are needed, see what changes are needed, and get back to us to saying that at these three schools we're going to have it, at these four schools we'll have it next year. I mean, that's what I want to get from you. Okay. You know, I, I, I want it all now. You do it too. Now, back to uh, the uh, referral system. I'm glad you indicated Mr. Cadania, members of the committee, and Mr. Chairman, it's clear when I say from the very beginning that all of the meetings, all of the brainstorming, all of everything we've done, all of the energy that's been spent in this, we still almost where we started last year. Mm -hmm. you, you said that. Yes. And so I just want the public to know that those of us on the council are not just being critical to be critical, but to make the analysis we have not. And I'm not going to sit here. Mr. Millicent, Mr. Cotanian, so next year this time, and hear the same thing. Uh, I'm not as frustrated as Mr. Cotanian. I'm more angry than frustrated because I see these kids every day. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, Ward 8 has the largest number of children in, in every ward. I see them. I see them on the corner of Martin Luther King and, and Mellon. I see them down on Good Hope Road. I see them down on South Capitol. I see them on Wheeler Road. See them on Alabama Avenue. I see them all over. After school starts, mm -hmm. I see a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I see them in some of the alleys. One final point, Mr. Chairman, about this subject. I meant to ask this uh, uh, Chief Grooms, but I've seen some of these officers David, try to chase some of these kids. They lose every time because they're out of shape. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Um, I'm, lo I'm looking at some data. We have in um, we have in some of the middle schools the buyer model, which I think we're calling something else now. Uh, last year, I think we were in something like four schools, two schools, two schools. You committed to uh, expand it. I think at one point we were in six schools. Yes, it, it shrunk to four schools. Yes, my understanding is right now the buyer model is in four schools. So last year we went from two schools hoping that we were going to expand it. Right now we're in four schools. We, we were in six. Let me finish. LaSalle back, but we are in four. I realized we were in six. We're Two in of them seem to drop out. Five. Uh, LaSalle Backus, Shaw Garnett Patterson, Johnson, Elliot Hine. If I'm reading this data correct, and I'm, I'm not sure I have all the data correct, um, truant, more than 10 days, 212 kids between those four middle schools. And the buyer model for the first half of this year graduated 17 kids, mm -hmm. 17 out of 212. Mm -hmm. Now, I look at the case management program. Now, case management is what we're calling for the high schools. Mm -hmm. The data I have is Anacostia, Ballou, Cardozo, Dunbar, Roosevelt, Spingarn, Woodson, other. I don't think that's a school. Now, Anacostia. I believe this would be the first half of this year, 286 kids truant, four in the case management mm -hmm. program. 
When I say four, I don't know if that's four out of the 286. Four out of the school are in the case management program. Baloo, 373 kids, truant, 10 days or more. Five kids are in the program. Uh, the total here is 1195 of all these schools, 1195, 53 are in the case management program. That's roughly where we were last year, uh -huh. plus or minus 10 kids. Uh -huh. I, w what I had said last year is we need to be able to take this citywide uh -huh. to reach the 3,000 kids, which Mr. Catania points out correctly, is actually that's only 21 days or more, plus 4,000, 11 days to 20 days. Okay. We've got a lot of kids. Uh -huh. We've got to expand this. The um, fair media, because some kids, and by your data, something like a third of the kids, transportation is an issue. The uh, DDOT indicated that um, they were ready. I think uh, the different conversations, the pilot would begin November 19th. The fair media just got out. I don't think the fair media is the way to go, which I guess is fair cards. Uh, and I've asked my staff to talk to WMATA, who told them to talk to DDOT, about adding value to, f to the smart cards, the, the one card, the ID card that the kids have. So my daughter, she has her ID card, add fair value to it. Yes. Uh, if the district government was as enlightened as the federal government, we would have metro subsidy. And so I could take my smart card and automatically load it on it would be 70 or $80 a month for me to take transit. We ought to be doing that for these truant mm -hmm. kids. But we're just now, I think, getting the fair cards into your hands. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, and, and I was reflecting on this after my first round of questions, I kind of want to scream. Um, and I'm not sure that it's going to work for me to scream at you, Chancellor. But I think this, the school system is on the truancy task force. And what I think is happening on the truancy task force is we have several agencies who are coming together. I've been to some of the meetings. And um, I'm going to try to be kind here. It's like bureaucracy, bureaucracy is talking to bureaucracies instead of some creative, creative minds that are feeling a fire mm -hmm. and saying, um, well, saying at the February meeting, we're two months behind. We can't do this. Or we're in, we're in double digits when we got quadruple digits, um, and, and those conversations aren't happening. Now, why am I saying all that? Uh, I'm, I don't, the reason why I'm saying that is because you are a player on the truancy task force where you can be, mm -hmm. and you've, you, TCPS has, has got to be um, bringing to the task force making the task force feel more urgency no. about this. Can I have I, a lot of I, questions here. Can and I, I respond to that? Yes. So I am as frustrated as you are. Let me tell you, who does not, who feels not excited about sitting in front of the same body with the same data as last year? That would be me. Um, I feel the fire. And in fact, the reason why we've seen movement at all is because with me feeling the fire, literally with every single principal this year, we looked at their truancy data and their goal setting meetings. And in fact, the reason why um, many of these numbers are moving is because we have actually tied it to principal evaluations because we've asked principals what they need to be supported to carry this work out. And because, in fact, one of our goals for principals is making schools engaging places where kids want to come. And so principals are actually focusing on that. We're focusing on making the connections with adults in the buildings. But my frustration is the same as yours. When we are, you know, the buyer model I have to use as an example. We said two years ago that the buyer model would not work. 
because we're not implementing the buyer model the way it was implemented in Kentucky. But that was not your testimony in July. We, because when I said the buyer model would not work, it was the chancellor is not supportive of this. If the chancellor was just supportive of this, right, then it would work. And so I was supportive. I made I made the the, the um, I made available all of my principles. We were incredibly supportive. And guess what? It's not working. In okay. fact, okay, but the the truancy task force, which has a steering committee, the steering committee meets in a very small room. But well, when the chief where where judge writes an op-ed that says, I'm not supportive, right, when in fact, we've actually done everything, our professional opinion doesn't count. It doesn't count. So we do the things that you ask us to do, and we're in the same place. Wait a minute. I didn't ask not you to you, do the buyer. You asked me to refer, and I'm referring. I'm referring. Oh, and, and I think that's the best news today. Yes. 90 percent. I think that's the best news. And we will and, continue to work And the CSS referral that. is up. I want to ask the question whether we really should be referring to CSS or whether there's something more constructive, but I won't go there. But I think that's all great. But when the steering, the, Ms. Fabricant, you were at the last meeting. I was. Everybody was, I, I felt I was given some pressure, was I not? Because I raised some you criticism, were. right? You were. Well, I think everybody should be sitting around the table and challenging each other what more we can do to, to, to get these numbers up. I frankly think it's going to be very hard to reduce the ninth grade truancy because I frankly think the ninth grade truancy is due to illiteracy. And, yes. the, and, and to, to deal with that illiteracy, you're either going to have to do something extraordinary with the ninth graders or you're going to have to improve literacy at the lower grades and, mm -hmm. and, and that way reduce the numbers that way, yes. a long-term strategy. Yes. But we're not having these conversations at the truancy task force meetings or at the steering committee meetings. Well, we're just not. Yes, you're right. And we are, we are nobody, having, nobody we are said having those conversations with my staff. Okay, but nobody said at the last, the steering committee meeting or the truancy meeting, hey, you know, buyer's great, and, but this isn't going to be our solution. We need to find plan B. Nobody has said that. Ms. Fabrican, am I correct? Nobody said that. When my principals say it, then they get tagged as not supportive. Oh, you got her when, off the hook. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm not. I'm not trying. To I have not heard that <laughs> said at the at the truancy task force meeting or the steering committee meeting. No, no one said it at that meeting. And I think case management's not working. It's and a voluntary. It's a voluntary program. And if you're not coming to school, I'm not sure why you would volunteer necessarily. Well, parents can volunteer you, but if the parents are having difficulty, they're probably not going to volunteer you. We ought to be talking about well, then what's the alternative to case management? But that's not happening at this. So I think that's where I'm leaving us in this my second round here, which I'm over. That I, I think where I should be criticizing you is that um, DCPS has got to do more with the other bureaucracies, which probably is through the steering committee or the task force, to get this thinking more creative and more urgent. That's two things: creative and urgent. Mm -hmm. I would yes. just, I would also add flexible because I think that one of the one of the concerns that we've had around both of these pilot programs has been the rigidity of the criteria that we have used to identify students, which has limited us to who we can target, um, and the way in which we can engage families. Okay, but who came up with that criteria? One of the bureaucracies. From where we sit, I'm trying to be nice here. We're the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. The executive came up with that criteria. And if the criteria is too inflexible, I, I think the, the steering committee or the task force is where there's got to be a discussion where if that's what you believe, and I'm not going to fall, I, I'm glad you believe that, that you, you DCPS, somebody's got to say that so that then we're all having an honest discussion. The, the criteria is too inflexible. We've got we to gotta change something. I don't feel like I said that right. The, the, there has to be more creative creativity in the discussion and urgency in the discussion. Can I share some of the creative things that we are doing? Okay. So, for example, we've been in partnership with the Department of Employment Services. 
to think about whether or not, and it looks like we can implement this coming summer, a differential pay scale for kids who are truant. We should not pay in the summer youth employment kids who have good attendance the same as kids who have bad attendance. In fact, if your attendance is too bad, you may not be able to get a summer youth employment job. You may need to come into an academic intervention before we allow you to take advantage of a summer youth employment job. We've been in, in conversations with DOES about um, in cases where kids are in twilight programs, can we employ them in some way during the day so that they're not on the street? Those are the kinds of creative things that we are actually able to work across the bureaucracies to do. Um, but as you know and I know, there are politics involved in all of these things. And so um, some of us are working very well together, working creatively and urgently to try to put things in place that will push the truancy rate down. I'm way over my time, Mr. Catania. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, Chancellor, this is uh, the, the, the problem I have with the testimony that was delivered. Um, you know, it was politely stated, but it's essentially you don't like the ideas that are currently in place with CFSA and not too veiled. You say it doesn't, in a not too veiled testimony, you, not only don't you like them, but you claim they don't work. All right? Now, let me, let me this, I, I, will, uh, I will read you conclusion. The data that we have simply do not indicate that CFSA and CSS referrals are a deterrent of truancy. All right, so you don't like our ideas, even though I'm not convinced that we have a full year to compare. And anecdotally, I've seen reductions in the pre-K, I'm sorry, pre-K through uh, eight uh, for uh, re reductions in truancy. The, the, then you provide a slide that talks about how kids who are actually, um, you know, referred by CFSA continue to have unexcused absences, mm -hmm. and that may be true, but unless you know what that was before, you cannot, we cannot know whether there are a reduction in such mm -hmm. uh, absences. Fair so enough. there's a lot of use of data that is, uh, that is of the point of view that you don't like this, and so you're going to cast it in a, in a, in a light that is unflattering. So you don't like uh, the plans that the council have initiated. I guess the student support teams, which came out of the South Capitol bill, I haven't heard you complain about those. Let's suggest, let's uh, suggest or submit that those are acceptable. But so not liking our ideas and then not producing adequate ones of your own. So I get it. Buyer you don't like, but it's seven kids. The, the high school case management is woefully uh, inadequate. Uh, and then, you know, so we have an initiative on transportation that we're still waiting to implement. Uh, and you bring Mr. Jackson here, who's doing a great job with the Twilight program. But, you know, I guess in the final analysis, I look at the ninth grade as an example. And I'm, I'm looking at what are you doing for the ninth grade, which accounts for one-third of all of your truants of 21 days or more. It accounts for a third of your truancy problem. And I'm not hearing anything, so you, you don't like our ideas. The ones that are on the table are underwhelming. You got a third of the problem there. And by the way, the ninth graders account for nearly half of all the kids retained. So there is a problem in the ninth grade. It, can we just agree that there's a problem with yes. ninth graders? Oh, yes. All right? And so we are in this discussion many years, and I'm still waiting for the aha moment where, okay, you don't like our ideas. The ones that you have, you can't implement uh, for whatever reason. But I'm still waiting for the, okay, now this is what we're going to do. Yeah. It's not that I don't like the referrals to CFSA. In fact, I'm very clear that I'm clear about the reason for them, and in fact, we're pursuing them vehemently. Them? Yes. Okay, but I don't, think, I don't think that because we're referring, that drives down the truancy rate significantly because we're at the same place. I think we need more time to look at the data, but I think that we also look at the root cause. The referral is not the thing that drives down truancy, is what my testimony shares. Well, I think, as I said, comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, we still have a few months in this year. Yes. I've looked at the data for a number of your elementary schools, and I, I don't see the kids with 1 to 10 that are going to be the 10 to 20. Yes. So I don't see this. I right. see it differently than you. Well, so let's wait till the end of the year and let's see. But I think the CFSA referral is not the only thing that's happening at these schools. Well, all right. Uh, some schools have received the grants. Uh, Right, um, we've extended the day at a number of our some schools. Some of them, and, and we have some you've had, uh, the Flamboyant has been uh, especially <laughs> aggressive and implemented this year. There have been other things being Well, and we've focused. I think what the council has brought to DCPS is holding our feet to the fire to focus on truancy, which then I'm now doing with my principals in a very different way. Good. Some, 
and I think that's helping Good. to drive this work. And, and I think, you know, it isn't uh, holding your feet to the fire for the sheer joy of doing it. It's right. so that we can actually have some results. So uh, in my office, uh, and I forgot if it was this week or last, we talked about, you know, uh, it's one thing to have your referrals to CSS court social services increase. It's num another thing for them to be successful referrals. Yes. Because what we hear all the time is that you'll refer them and they kick them back to you. Yes. And even the ones that exist, we still have to hope that the Attorney General will prosecute because a simple referral does not mean that there is a prosecution. So absent from the numbers are how many kids have had properly um, uh, constituted referrals to CSS and of those, how many has the Attorney General actually followed through with? And I don't believe that the stick is the only solution here, but in the complete absence of a stick, you know, where the, where the grown-up government of this city basically says, we will race to the bottom and it's whatever you want and whatever you find acceptable, uh, and, then, you know, and that's okay with us. I mean, I'm confident, for instance, that if, that if robbery were not, if there weren't a certainty associated with the punishment of robbery, there would be more of it. It's just common sense. Now, I'm yes. not suggesting that the two are the same, but if we value something enough that we attach a penalty to the failure to execute, mm -hmm. but there is no penalty, mm -hmm. it sends a signal that we don't value it. The things mm -hmm. we value, we follow through with on community standards, yeah. and we have none as it relates to truancy. So you are left to try to come up with any number of ideas to try to fix the situation. And again, this follows on what this council did with South Capitol and the student support teams that you are implementing and all the additional things we're trying to do on the social services front to get to root cause analysis and lead with services. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there needs to be more. I want to, I want to end with this, Mr. Chairman, that we have a ninth grade problem. Uh, it is both, re it is reflected in dropout, retention uh, and and truancy all of the above mm -hmm. and I'm looking for a ninth grade solution yeah. while we end social promotion in this uh, in this system because it is producing one class after another of ninth graders who are not ready to perform mm -hmm. and they are relegated by and large to our non-application public high schools mm -hmm and you have ninth grades that are littered with kids who cannot read, sitting next to kids who are ready, and both of them are failed by a system that addresses neither of their needs. Yeah. Those that who are ready to learn can't, and those who can't don't have the services to mainstream and move on. Yeah. That is the focus, Madam yeah. Chancellor, yeah. right? Truancy yes. is a symptom, oh in my mind, a symptom yeah. of the failure to make sure the child is on grade level all along. They hit ninth grade, and they start to fail. It's over for that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this discussion has been healthy, but the fact of the matter is there are thousands of young people and their parents have been failed by this system and by this city. We're sending people to the penitentiary <clears throat> every day, to CSFA, to other places. And so let's face it, we have to do it a lot differently and have to do it faster. And I think the chance, I know the chance that we would be on that. On the other hand, I think we have to have, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we have to have more mayoral leadership. I support Mr. Gray. But I don't think he has been as vigorous as he needs to be in solving these disputes. The other problem we have, Mr. Chair of the Committee, is that I presided over this bureaucracy for 16 years. I know it fairly well. And what's happening in this bureaucracy, happening in my bureaucracy today, I stopped it, is that colleagues in one cabinet member are not going to challenge that much the other cabinet other members of that bureaucracy. And the chancellor knows that that's true. I'm sure she's seen it. I'm sure she ought to say something to X, Y, Z. This is not working, and I don't want to do it anymore. But there's that not that feeling that you can challenge uh, academically and professionally another colleague. I, I tell you this happened. I'm not going to ask you to come in on it, because that would be falling into what I just said happened. And so I know that happened, Mr. Chairman and David. That's what happens. And on the other hand, you have unevenness even in the truancy task force. There are some people who know more 
and others who don't know more. And so you got that unevenness. Madam Chancellor, it seems to me if you feel that you've got to do something the council members tell you to do, ask you to do, you have a responsibility to tell the mayor that that's not working, and you have a responsibility and in a hearing to tell us what you just told us today about the bio model. Mm -hmm. It ain't working. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work the way it is. One, you got 3,000 people, and with this process now, would take two years to even get to that group, and then another two years to get to another group, and we're going forward. So uh, this has been healthy for all of us, and many of us have, have asked these kind of questions. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can get a better model of the truancy task force. That's why I suggested, Madam Chancellor, that we move it up to a higher level of the city administrator on top of he he can mediate these disputes. Got a legitimate differences of opinion. We have differences of opinion on the city council. The only way we resolve those differences is by votes. And you members don't have votes like that. And so uh, uh, I know I've talked to you about this and that you would like to be free to do educational things from food service preparation, from doing all these reports and reading these reports, mediating these things over here. What you want to do, and I'll ask you about this, you want to spend all of your time working on educational matters mm -hmm. that will move this system forward as we do it. So do you agree that agree. If, you, if, you, if, all, if you were free from all these other things, you could yes. do your job better? I agree. Huh? I agree. You know, so uh, members of the council, we just have to uh, push an agenda uh, where we take those things and put them where they are. The truancy model ought to be at the top, not where it is now, where you are viewed as the obstructionist or you're the leader of what's happening over there. I want Alan Liu to chair this truancy task force. I want every member of that task force not to send in seconds, not send in thirds, but send themselves. The department head, Mr. Chairman, ought to be at every one of these meetings engaging in this discussion and be held accountable for what they say they want to do. I, I was trained as a scientist, and I was taught if something is failing, stop it. If it's failing, stop it. Or moderate it, or modify it. And we don't do that in this system. We just <laughs> keep letting failures go on and on and on. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the public who's watching this ought to know that we all are committed to the same thing. We're not all doing the same way. And we have failed these kids. These 3,000 people, David, we have failed them. We have failed them. By our own admission, Ms. Donald testified that once she gets a referral, it takes another who knows how long to get to the bottom of it at the same time. This student is still out of school. And the further you get out of school, and finally, Mr. Chairman, we know, Madam Chair, I disagree with you on this differenti differentiated uh, wage for those who are truant, they get less. Because what you're going to do is drive them out of the system, drive them to the streets where they're already being driven all the time. They're tempted by this drug selling. They're tempted by making money some other place. And so, therefore, I'm chair of that committee. And I guarantee you, you would never have that happen uh, in, in terms of the same job program. I'd like to talk to you about some other models, the other ways you can get these children. And, 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 the, and the fact is, we had 20,000 young people registered for summer jobs. Mm -hmm. Only 14,000 brought all the papers and all the paperwork. I bet if you did an analysis, they're the same kids who are, proud, who are truant from school. They're the same ones who have behavioral problems. The same ones who have academic problems. I want to talk to you about some other models that may work. But see, I know the problem. The good kids are doing this, and they say the bad kids get this. No, it doesn't work that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Um, I had just a, a three more questions. Uh, with regard to the student support teams, the um, I have a note here from staff. In uh, December, uh, you indicated to date 100% of schools have identified an SST coordinator and 62% of the schools have complete, completed SST teams. I also have a memo from you, I think it's January 23rd, that says, 
hundred percent of the schools have student support teams. Yes. So where are we with the SSTs? All of our schools have student support teams, fully constituted students. Support fully teams. constituted. So yes. um, if I were to um, look at uh, Principal Jackson, the um, <coughs> I'm not going to ask a question of you, but uh, there's we an We could get SS you the names of the people who are on every SST for every And school. if there's a kid who's having some issues, the SST is, can come into play at every school. Yes, at day five of the conference, right? The um, every school? Second, uh, every school. second question I have. I actually uh, highlighted the same sentence that Mr. Katani asked you about, where you said the data, the data that we have simply do not indicate that CFSA and CSS referrals are to turn to truancy. Now the reason why I highlighted it was because, and I wrote a note in the margin, not my goal. I don't see the referrals as um, intended to be a deterrent. If, if what you meant by that was to deter a student, a student says, oh, I'm going to get referred, yes. I don't want to get referred, so I'm going to attend. That's right. I don't see it that way at all. I see it as um, more with CFSA than with CSS. Um, that we then can find out what's going on. Yes. And um, I don't think of that as deterrence. Now, maybe I'm just taking the word differently than you. But to me, um, it's it's important that we understand why, why a kid is truant. Because if we don't understand why a kid is truant, then we surely can't help. Yes. We've had these conversations. You and I have had these conversations. Yes. And I fully believe and I support that. Once we, once, what the referrals do is give us information that then can help us address the root causes of why kids are truant. But I think that people believe that the, the referral themselves will actually defer, uh, uh, deter kids from being truant or deter families from being truant. And I don't think that that is the case. I'm sorry, I didn't quite say that. I again. agree with you that identifying the kids so that we can understand what the root cause is, yes. that that is the purpose of the CFSA referral. Yes. And I not agree with that. deterrence. Right. In the same sense that we, you talk about deterrence in the criminal justice system. Right. Because I, I think that's pretty fundamental to how we approach truancy. Agree, and this is why we've increased our capacity and focus to be able to do that well. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I wish we were exploring today, but Superior Court chose not to send a representative is to understand where the, how, see, what role CSS has. I, I just, I'm not quite sure I get that. Unless it's that court social services, uh, because I deal with kids, juvenile delinquents on probation, uh, maybe the thinking is that they have some great insights into what to do with truants. Uh, but we can't explore that here. My third question is, I met with somebody I don't want to. I don't mean to be pushing a particular organization, the Literacy Lab. I, if you're not familiar with it, I think some folks in DCPS are. Uh, what they're trying to do is um, uh, replicate a model developed in Minnesota, which is to bring some extra resources, which I think come sometimes during school and after school to kids who are having problems with reading. Uh -huh. um, I think it's focused. I don't think it's focused entirely on, um, no, it is elementary and grades K through three. It seems to me that this is part of, something like this is part of the yep. um, strategy. Um, yes, uh, agree. The reason I'm pulling this out is because there may be a role for buyer model. Uh, it certainly works, and if a principal is committed to it, then it probably has a greater chance of working. But something like literacy intervention, mm -hmm. and, um, literacy intervention seems to me that that would work. I think when you see uh, at, in our budget for the coming year, you will see um, that and more reflected. The focus on literacy reflected in our budget for the coming year. Literacy intervention. Yes. Additional reading specialists, assistant principals for literacy. There are a whole host of things that we're doing on the literacy front. Um, that you'll see in our budget presentation. Perhaps that ought to be a measurable goal in our truancy um, reduction strategy? Yes, I I'd be psyched to, to add that. Do any of the other members have uh, questions? Mr. Catania? Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I want to have my final round focused on some things that I think that are very positive going on within uh, DCPS. Um, and you know it's a it's a great privilege to chair the committee on education and to see the work 
uh, that our administration and principals and teachers are engaged in. Uh, having been on this body for, you know, since 1997, I've seen uh, this DCPS in a different era, at a different time. And, you know, with, with very, very, very few exceptions, one I can count on, on one hand, I have been incredibly impressed with every adult that I've come in contact with in our schools. Uh, our principals are an extraordinarily talented group of individuals. Our teachers, and I'm talking about traditional DCPS, I visit both traditional and charter schools, and both are public education systems. But in both systems, and right now I'll talk about DCPS, I think it's important for us while we dwell on the things we want to do better, uh, that I view my role is to be a partner in leadership with the chancellor and the mayor and the deputy mayor and the state the superintendent to solve problems. Now, it doesn't always mean that we're going to agree or that we see things the same way. But I don't want to let this opportunity go by, Mr. Chairman, without saying that I do think we are led by an extremely capable chancellor. Uh, and she did not create this mess. Uh, this mess did not occur overnight. Uh, this, 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 this organized uh, uh, system of, uh, of, of indifference and of, uh, of low outcomes was not of her making. And she is left to try to stitch this together while at the same time we educate kids. Now, I, I will say there will be on our journey, there will be times like today when we have very, very different points of view, perhaps, or different senses of urgency. Uh, I think our goal is the same. We want to see every child have a chance. Uh, I am continuously frustrated by the amount of time and attention we spend trying to remediate and the absolute absence of effort on the very, very talented kids in our system who show up and don't cause a problem and don't have a chance as a result. They are weighted down like an albatross around their neck while the system uh, is in, in, invariably focused on underperformers or those who, for whatever reason, parent participation included, don't show up. And I'm tired of it. We have talented kids, and we deserve gifted and talented programs. We, we deserve language immersion courses that are pre-K through high school and STEM courses and art courses and, and schools that are going to demonstrate the excellence which is possible in our children. This constant focus on this is, it's, it is necessary because it is, in fact, the, the Pied Piper that directs our resources at the moment. And I'm eager to turn the page so we can pick, see this pixelating system come into full view and the talent that is there. I think we could build a 21st century American school system that is combination charter and traditional public that is going to be the envy of the country. I believe that. But we have to tackle these problems and we can't dance around them anymore. And that's why I will be working with you as, again, partners in leadership on how to tackle this ninth grade problem. I believe we have got to end this social promotion, and I want to end with this simple illustration. Last year, even though it's eighth grade is one of the three grades we can hold kids back, this system passed on 99.2% of the eighth graders last year. Out of 1,706, the system passed on 1,692. They are currently freshmen in our schools. We've held back 14. Now, I believe that it is highly likely that all of these 1692 are not going to pass. Mm -hmm. I believe last year what happened was the same as this year, mm -hmm. that a third will fail mm -hmm. because they could not read on grade level and they could not perform basic algebra. This must stop. We must remedy this in the short run. But, Chancellor, we must stop this. And it isn't to simply hold a child back to see that they fail. It's to hold each parent and teacher and principal and council member accountable for a system that does not lie to this child and say <coughs> that you are ready to succeed because we know you are not. Yep. All right? And that means absolute mandatory summer school for kids yep. who are not in school. Yep. I want to look at, at, at reviewing our the system that we, that we use, Chancellor, to uh, our report cards mm -hmm. because I don't think they tell the parent on a quarterly basis, whether your child is on grade, grade level or progressing. They, I've, I've seen one. They make no sense to me. So how we report progress has got to, has got to uh, dovetail, has got to be integrated in this new system where we require that a child be ready to go. Now, that means all hands on deck, no more excuses. And for God's sake, no more by operation of law, I have to pass you on, yeah. even though I know and your parents know and everyone else knows you're not ready. 
It's also removing the disincentive, removing the dis the incentive for the teacher to pass along because right they on. don't want to see the person. So I, I expect us to be absolutely aligned on this yep. going forward. Sure and enough. I know Principal Jackson. I don't want to put him on the spot. I know he believes the same thing I believe. And I don't want to put him on the spot. <laughs> I know he believes it, and I know our other non-application high school principals see it. It cannot be a great job to be a non-application principal in one of these schools and see half of these kids or a third of them fail outright and others who should, but we pass them anyway because yep. they show up and they're polite yep. and they're not ready to go on to the 10th grade. Yep. Chancellor, you and I are partners. Sometimes it's going to be easier than others. All right. I'm okay with that. I appreciate your focus and I appreciate your service and those of the many other excellent people within DCPS. Thank you. Mr. Berry's insisting I call on him. I'm not insisting on it. I mean, well, if you're not, then we'll on, move on. On, on fairness, that's all. <laughs> but seriously, we, we get along very well up here. And this hearing is about truancy reduction. And the truth has to be told about that. And not to negate all of the wonderful things we're doing in this system. And I've told the Chancellor this publicly, I've told her this privately that uh, she should uh, take responsibility for anything she didn't do and not responsible for, but just a matter of telling us about it. And so I don't want anybody to think that I'm not uh, uh, mindful of the wonderful things and going on in certain of our schools. Uh, I'm a public school advocate, a choice advocate. Uh, my son went to private school to the third grade. He went to St. Albans in the fourth grade. Ephraim and I disagreed on it, but you know how that works. But he went to Merch in the fifth grade. Went to Jefferson in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Went to Wilson Senior High, ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and twelfth grade. And graduated in 1998. Uh, I don't think you ought to use your kids as pawns, but I use that only as an example that I'm committed to the education of uh, all of our students, either in charter schools or in traditional public schools. On the other hand, I believe in choice because a parent should not be stuck with not having an opportunity to get their kid out of a low-performing class, whether it's charter or public school, and we both agree on that. And so I think at our next hearing, we ought to find a way to, to highlight those things that are there. But we can't sweep under the rug. Nobody's tried that. Those things are not working. And, uh, you know, the problem, in, in, to some extent, is that that's why I want to move this up to a, a level that the city administrator can make decisions and get department heads doing more than they want to do. It's going to take us all working as hard as we can to make the system work. There's an old African proverb that says it takes the village to raise a child. And the whole city, the D.C. government, is that village. And Chancellor, you're not the only one who should be held responsible for the education of our kids. But the fact of the matter is, 32,000 of our 47,000 young people are from low-income communities, mm -hmm. low-income parents. Uh, and we know educationally that they don't come to school ready to learn as rapid as those like Christopher and others. Uh, and also we know that a parent who can't read can't teach their kids to read. Mm -hmm. There are a number of parents who don't know anything about algebra, know anything about calculus or physics, or they do math. And so the system has to provide a way where they can do that. We had the same problem I talked to Donald about foster parents. They have a responsibility to act as parents, to go to to meetings, to be involved with that whole thing. And I'm so glad that the city and all of us are going to put a lot of emphasis on literacy. A third of the adults in Ward 8 are considered non-literate. A third of the 73,000 people there. That's a big number. And finding, uh, I'm not finding yet, this is going to clock. Uh, the problem is just so much. So it's the magnitude of it which pulls us down, Mr. Chairman, Mr. David. It's just so massive. Mm -hmm. They have 439 uh, students from Baloo, chronic, 
out of seven, eight hundred students, that's a heck of a number. Mm -hmm. At most of our low income schools and communities. At Baloo, I use Baloo because I'm proud of Baloo. We've got a great principal, got great teachers, got great staff. At Anacost, the same thing. But we have 800 students at Baloo. It, we had, if we get more than 150 parents out, we're very lucky if we feed them. That shouldn't be. So, Madam Chancellor, I've been pushing you on this. We need to have more parent coordinators in, the, in these schools that really work and visit at homes too. And one other thing too, Mr. Dell, how many attendance offices do you have per school? Um, there's one attendance counselor at our high schools. Ain't that something? But, well, hold it. But other schools, so some of our intensive schools, no, I'm not actually talking about added that. three attendance counselors well, that's not, that's two a, years think ago. Think about it. You so, got one attendance office at a high school for 800 students. Is that right? Yep. Yes, there's one that, attendance but, counselor, so, but there are additional in your 14 budget, as well. uh, Madam Chancellor, those of us on the committee expect to see a lot more attendance office. That's not the solution to the problem. Sure is not. But it helps to identify uh, <laughs> those who need to be uh, attendance office, kind of coordinate, getting the principal and teachers and everybody else on these home visits. <laughs> but I'm talking more about that. But one attendance officer at Baloo, that's on each chapter. More than one I understand that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Thank you, uh, Chancellor, uh, Ms. Fabricant, and uh, Principal Jackson. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one last witness, uh, Charisma Howell, Deputy Director, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. While, while she's coming forward, Mr. Katania. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I'm sorry, but I have to leave at this point. I have a Ward 7 Education Council meeting at this point. Uh, I'm trying to encourage our uh, Davis families to go to Plummer. And so I'm trying to help the Chancellor in her work to make sure that we retain our kids in this moment of school transformation, and I, I think I over-scheduled myself, Mr. Chairman, so I have to beg out. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you'd raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia, Committee on Education, Committee of the Whole, is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Do we have a statement from you? Uh, there's a statement from Director Butler, yes. When you're ready. Good evening, Chairman Mendelson and honorable members of the council. My name is Charisma Howell. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, commonly referred to as the CJCC. I'm here on behalf of CJCC's Executive Director, Minone Butler. Director Butler is unable to attend today's hearing. In light of her absence and the importance of the subject matter, I've been asked to read her testimony for the record. Her testimony is as follows. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and honorable members of the Council. Thank you for providing me an opportunity to discuss the Truancy Court Diversion Program. The Criminal Justice Coordinating Council was established to facilitate interagency cooperation among the district's federal and local criminal justice agencies to address systemic issues that impact public safety in the nation's capital. The CJCC's strategic priorities are collectively determined by our members. The CJCC members determined that truancy and delinquency should be a focus, and the CJCC has worked to convene the necessary stakeholders to address this issue. In 2010, the Truancy Task Force was revived and instructed by the mayor to address the issue of truancy for the 2011-2012 school year. Chief Judge of the D.C. Superior Court, Lee F. Satterfield, championed the charge to bring the court-led TCDP program into the district's public schools. TCDP, the Truancy Court Diversion Program, is an adaptation of the Byer model originally implemented by the family court judge Joan Byer in Louisville, Kentucky. The Byer model is a diversion program that was an alternative for families facing prosecution for truancy. TCDP proactively seeks out truant families who are in danger of CFSA involvement. Students are identified based primarily upon attendance and the lack of court social services or child and family services involvement. The Truancy Court Diversion Program is a 10-week collaborative effort of the district's criminal justice, education, and human service agencies. The goal is to identify middle school students who are at risk of becoming chronically truant 
and to assist them and their families in overcoming barriers to school attendance using a multi-agency approach involving a team of judges, school staff, case managers, and the CJCC. Each partner plays a significant role in, su in successful program implementation. The District of Columbia Superior Court oversees the one-on-one -on -one family meetings and assists in program instruction. The District of Columbia Public Schools Office of Youth Engagement provides the names of eligible students from its attendance database along with up-to-date attendance and academic information on student participants. They also assist in soliciting and encouraging participation from the appropriate staff members at each school. Each school site is asked to dedicate two support staff, typically a social worker and the attendance counselor, to attend the sessions, assist in the ongoing engagement, and provide regular academic updates and administrative support. The collaboratives are responsible for engagement and providing ongoing social service supports. The CJCC coordinates the efforts of all stakeholders, provides timely updates, carries out the program curriculum, and promotes interagency information sharing. The program was launched, launched in the spring of 2012 and implemented in two middle schools, Johnson Middle School and Kramer Middle School. An evaluation of the spring 2012 cohort, funded by the Justice Grants Administration, was conducted by the DC Crime Policy Institute, also known as DCPI. According to DCPI's reports, the program produced, quote, overwhelmingly positive, unquote, feedback from parents and students, including students had improved attitudes towards school and acknowledged their responsibility. Let me to interrupt you for school. a second. How many kids are we talking about? For which kids talk? You have to give me a little bit more. How many kids are we talking about for? What you're testifying about. The buyer, which cohort? Well, you're talking about the two middle schools in 2012. The spring cohort of 2012. So you don't know that number offhand? I do. The spring cohort of 2012 had 15 participants in the program. 15? Yes, sir. All right, so we're talking about 15 kids. Yes, sir. Okay, out of 3,000 druids. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I don't think it's really worth your reading those bullets. We're talking about so many, so few kids. I mean, I don't want to, I, you've got roughly 15 minutes of testimony here. You were in two schools last um, spring. You're now in four schools? Yes, sir. How many kids? You talk about how many are eligible. How many kids are actually For the current cohort, the spring 2013 cohort, there are a total of 25 participants. Out of how many? Um, truants in those schools? I'm not sure how many truants are in each of the schools. By my calculation, um, 212. 20 kids out of 212. Uh, if that's the number of truant students, then right, yes. That's roughly 2.5%. Did I do that calculation wrong? 10%. Um, the, um, the question that I asked, uh, that, that I raised with the Chancellor, that I raised with you, and I've raised this before, how do you get this citywide? There are a number of uh, issues with regard to expanding this program, and it's also included in the testimony. And where would that you be? Give me just a second. I can find it and read it to you. Efforts to expand or improve the program should be con efforts to expand or improve the program should consider the program's intangible realities, which includes convincing already reluctant, distrustful, or disengaged families to participate in a voluntary program. The question that belies for the Truancy Task Force Steering Committee now is would making this program mandatory for select families improve participation? Our collaborative partners, in addition to our partners at the school system have indicated a number of problems trying to engage eligible families to participate in this program. In large measure, that is one of the reasons why participation is one of the reasons that they attribute to participation being so low. Uh, when was the last time that you brought this question to the uh, task force or the steering committee? The question of 
what you just said. Now, would now making this program mandatory for select families? Yeah. This is a this is a recent iterate. This is a recent uh, question that we came up with in light of the numbers based on the first week, full week of participation for the current cohort. There were a number of problems that impeded the um, successful launch of the program in the fall, and so we wanted to see how it would what would come to fruition in the spring before really making any assessments. And based on what we've seen as of today, having each of the schools actively in the spring cohort, this is the most recent, this is the question that we feel needs to be asked. So it's basically taken you ten, two years. Task Force was revived in 2010. We're actually in 2013. I'll say two years. It's taken you two years to get to that question of the participation, which I believe you said last year was 15 who graduated. Two schools, 15. Yes. It's taken you almost another year to get to this question of um, uh, mandatory, making it whether it should be made mandatory. My point really not being that it's taken you that long, but uh, it hasn't. You haven't brought it up to the the uh, task force. The CJCC has not. No. We don't speak on behalf of the task force. We are just we operate as program managers for the. For the um, CJCC the coordinates the task force, correct? We assist with the coordination of the task force. The task force is chaired. It's got three chairs that are responsible for creating and implementing the objectives and goals. The, for the task, task force, force is a creation of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, correct? I do not know that. You don't know that. No, no, Mr. Chairman. You really don't know that. No, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, the, I'm, my understanding is that the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, really the staff, that's you're representing the staff, is responsible for the strategic plan. No, Chairman. The Truancy Task Force, uh, under the leadership of the Deputy Mayor of Education, has been creating the strategic plan. We are not responsible. So for the she's the one of the who wrote plan. that the implementation plan, the um, let's see, goal one is programmatic assessment, alignment, and leveraging to support improved school attendance. You're saying Jennifer Leonard wrote that? I don't know if Deputy Mayor Leonard wrote that herself. I do know that the Deputy Mayor of Education's office has been leading the creation of the strategic the strategic plan for the task force. Um, as you can t tell, I'm, I'm really not quite sure what to say. Because basically what your testimony is, is that CJCC doesn't have a role in this. I can tell you that the CJCC established the task force. And that uh, your boss, Manon Butler, is the one who's come in with the implementation plan. That this stuff, as far as I know, is written by your office. That your office is the one that's been responsible for administering what you now call the Tunsi Court Diversion Program, which used to be called the Buyer Model. Your office has been front and center in this. Our and what your testimony is, is that no, it's not. It's Jennifer Leonard. Jennifer Leonard isn't even a member of the CJCC. She's not a member of the CJCC, but she is the, one of the co-chairs for the Truancy Task Force. But and you're I saying the Truancy the Task CJ Force has no responsibility. Excuse me, you're saying that the CJCC has no responsibility for this. I mean, I think this is shameful. And this is really the biggest part of the problem. We have these meetings, as I said before, and Mr. Catania said before, where, where the truth is not being discussed. I think that's a fair way of putting it. We find out today, I'm very glad that Ms. Fabricant said that she thinks the buyer model's not working. I'm very glad that she said that. It has yet to be said at any of the task force meetings, nor at any of the, the steering committee meetings. And underlying all of it is this implementation plan. And I will hold it up so everybody can see. And I want you to notice the blank columns. This is the implementation plan. Do you know how long this implementation plan has been drafted? No, Chair. How long have you been with the agency? Uh, it'll be a year in April. A year in April. 
Yes, Chair. Well, but when you came, this was being drafted, was it not? I don't recall, Chair. Really? You don't recall? No, Chair. This plan has been drafted, being, being drafted for two years. Maybe I'm exaggerating slightly. Let me think for a second. Fall of 2011. Fall of 2011. What does that work out to? A year and a half. And we have these incoherent goals and actions. Goal one, this is how we're going to solve truancy in the District of Columbia. I want to read this so that the public knows what's going on. The goal one to reduce truancy in the city is programmatic assessment, alignment, and leveraging to support improved school attendance. I don't know what that means. There are three actions under that. The first is leverage task force members. I don't know what that means to leverage a task force member. Leverage task force members to identify policy programs and practices within their organizations. I would think the strategic plan would identify the programs policies and practices, but this says no. We're going to leverage the task force members to identify policies, programs, and practices. I don't know what the task force has been doing or what your office has been doing for two years. Within their organizations where truancy prevention and interventions can be embedded strategically to support district children, youth, and families in attending school consistently. Sir Grasso, does that mean anything to you? The second action is strengthen and sustain existing programs of the TCDP, which Ms. Fabricant said today really isn't working, and CMPI programs, expand pilot programs as appropriate. What agency is responsible for it? Can you tell me? For implementation of the Truancy Court Diversion Program, CJCC is a program manager for Truancy Court Diversion Program. It's not here. It's a blank column. As I mentioned earlier, Chairman, we did not author this strategic plan. We, uh, we have, I believe we have seen it before and provided feedback, but... You distribute this. No, Chairman, we did not distribute the strategic plan. Ms. Howe, I was at the um, CJCC meeting in the beginning of January where the strategic plan or the, the goals for the year were distributed, and this was on it. You all distributed that. We took the strategic plan that was created by the task force and inserted the goals from the strategic plan from the task force into the CJCC priorities. I think you need to take back to Ms. Butler that this is completely unacceptable and that she needs to explain to the CJCC how the CJCC is going to have control over this or that they're or requested the CJCC abandon this and would just give it to the deputy mayor or whatever. This is I, I'm really not sure what to say. I, this is just unacceptable. Do you have anything more to say? I do not, Chairman. Thank you. It's not a question, Mr. Barry. Am I taking more time? Oh, no, I'm Basically what we have is an officer, uh, the deputy director, am I correct, deputy director yes, for the Chairman. agency, yes, who's saying she has nothing to do with this task force plan, the task force of the CJCC, she has nothing to do with it. No, Chairman. Can't I'm defend it, can't explain it, somebody else is responsible for it. I'm not am saying I that we don't have anything to do with the strategic plan for the task force, but we are not the primary authors of the strategic plan for the task force. That's what I'm suggesting. The CJCC oh, provides no, staff No, that's support very clever staff. language because Fantastic. what I'm pointing to is on page 26 of a 29-page document. You may not have authored the first, 26, the first 25 pages. The plan, the implementation plan is on page 26, and it has every, it, it has, this was written by your office. I know that for a fact. Your office is the one that circulated it to the CJCC members. And you're now disclaiming responsibility for it. The CJCC is not the author of the strategic plan for the task force. If it was circulated to the CJCC You're principles. not the author of this, but you are the author of this. And why have you not asked for an agency responsibility, a timeline? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. You work for the CJCC, correct? Yes, sir. The CJCC hands this out to its members. 
the CJCC supports the, the work of the task force, correct? The CJCC okay. is Why have you not asked to fill in a timeline? Why have you not asked to put in who the, what agency is responsible? Why do we just keep perpetuating a meaningless document? Once again, Chairman, we are not the primary author of that document, although I do believe that recently a request was sent to the agencies of the steering te uh, the truancy task force requesting additional information to fill in those blanks. This is a draft of the strategic plan. This, this plan has been in draft for a year and a half. When are we going to reduce truancy? I don't have an answer for that, Chair. Mr. Grosso, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Ms. Howell. Uh, what's your job and, and what you do? As the de Deputy Director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council? Yes. I'm responsible for oversight of office uh, staff. I'm responsible for overseeing the programmatic sections of Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and also assist with oversight of the Statistical Analysis Center. What's your uh, educational background? I have a Juris Doctorate. I also have a Master's of Law. I have a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Yeah, I, I share the uh, Chairman's outrage. I mean, I made sure it would have been different. But he's right to be outraged by this. He's been very familiar with this situation. He attended various meetings at the CC, CJCC. He was chair of the Judiciary Committee until he became chair. And he knows a lot about this. And it's a meanless doctor. I agree with him. Who prepared the strategic plan for the youth, for the task force? Who prepared? I'm sorry, Chair. Who prepared the strategic plan for the uh, truancy task force? The truancy task force strategic plan was created with the leadership. It was a collaborative effort, but was created primarily under the leadership of the Office of the Deputy Mayor. Between, between who and who? Bet I'm sorry. Between who and who in terms of a collaboration? The task force steering committee members. This is how, now you've been around, you're very smart. You know committee members, just in and of themselves, can't prepare this document. They may input into it. You've got to have somebody writing the document. Who wrote this document? The primary author for the document was out of the deputy mayor of, of education's office. Who was that, Mr. Dr. Wright, when he was here? Uh, Who was it? it? If the chairman is correct and it has been in progress for the last year and a half would have spanned over Deputy Mayor Wright's uh, Would you have known that as a Deputy Director of CJCC who and when this was prepared and if Dr. Wright prepared it and he's now gone, would you have kept track of who prepared it? Not uh, who added to it? Uh, not necessarily. Um, so you, you're answering questions like a lawyer and I don't like that. Uh, I really don't. I mean, I like lawyers, but I don't like the way you answer it. You're very careful. You're very narrow in your approach. You're very, I don't recall this or I don't recall that. That's legal lease. I've been around a lot of lawyers. I've had to have a lot of lawyers represent, represent me in a lot of cases. And so I agree with the chairman. I mean, this, this is not worth the paper it's written on. What's your act? You, you think this is why you come before the city council, committee on the whole and the education committee. I'm a member of the education committee. That's how you testify. Have you been before any kind of legislative body before? Yes, I have, Council. This one? Not this one. What? Which ones? Federal bodies. Big one? Uh, federal bodies. Which ones? Um, can't remember the name of the committee. Come on, Miss Howe. Come on with that. Time You've been a member. The chairman, I'm, I'm even more outraged than you. She can't remember who she appeared before. Not, That's not for that. this Excuse council. Me. Excuse the expression. For the that is nonsense. You said I have appeared before federal bodies. I said, which ones? I don't remember. That's what you said. Know what you said? Yes, sir. I don't recall which ex exactly which committee I, s I testified in front of. When was this that you testified? It's about four years ago. And you don't remember. Your memory is that bad. And you're a lawyer. 
remember facts and situation, and you don't remember who you testified before, when you testified, maybe four years, maybe three years. Come on, Ms. Hall. With that kind of attitude, you shouldn't be working for the D.C. government, quite frankly. You really shouldn't. And I didn't even know you before you came right here. And I'm always sympathetic to D.C. government employees because I had to, had to manage uh, them when I, for 16 years. But this is awful. Really, it's awful. It's unprofessional. Ms. Chairman, can you remember, can you imagine not remembering what committee she appeared before and when she appeared before them and what federal body she appeared before? I mean, I can't believe it. But anyway, I've said enough because I keep talking and my blood pressure goes up uh, with this kind of nonsense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just am curious. In the October 16th report from the strategic, from the DC Truancy Task Force strategic plan, on that version, and it looks like there are significant numbers of goals and objectives and everything all filled in with agencies, and it's it's pretty detailed. I'm not sure if on the one that the chairman has, it's uh, what is it again, Chairman? February this month, um, and they're not filled in. It's is that a, just a staff thing? I mean, this is deep. I'm, in fact, when I read this, you know, it looked good to me. It was right on target. I mean, there was agencies assigned between DCPS and OSSI and the Charter School Board. The task force had some tasks as well. Um, there was it, discussions around the grants. I mean, this this is strange because it looks like it may have gone backwards in time when it was going forwards in time. Uh let me reiterate that we were not the authors of this document. Right. So the, the changes, you know, we eliminated this, we took that out. Um, I would guess or is the result of input and feedback from the agencies that are indicated in the report. But not being the primary author, I really can't describe for you why no, that's, that's changes cool. were I mean, included. Or I'm, cur I'm, I'm just don't know if you've heard anything in the meetings, whether or not, you know, because there was the distinct difference is that this was from Deputy Mayor Wright the one that I'm looking at, and then I think the one the chairman's looking at is from Deputy Mayor Leonard, and I don't know if there was some wholesale removal of the strategic plan and starting over, and if you're aware of that, that would be relevant to the progress. I know you guys are staffing this. I really understand that, and I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I don't really care where you testified before, but I, I'm curious about this effort. If you were engaged in it at all, was there a wholesale removal of the at, you know, work that was done earlier, you know, late last year to today. I'm not familiar um, enough with the uh, the progress of the strategic plan to respond to your question. Um, I think it, would, it 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 is quite possible, but I'm not familiar enough with the strategic. Do plan. you go to the task force meetings? Is that your occasionally? If Director Butler is unavailable, then I will attend. Okay, so it's generally so Director Butler might know if there was a wholesale overhaul of the strategic plan between last fall and today? She she may, but that's probably a, a question better suited for um, the deputy mayor. The deputy mayor. She was here, too. All right. Well, I don't have any further questions, Chairman. I mean, I think I would urge you and others to read the October one and see if that's the one we'd like them to implement as a, the strategic plan moving forward if there's still value in this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Uh, I've calmed down a little bit. Let me be clear here. Um, at the least, CJCC, the staff, that's you, Ms. Howell, your boss, uh, Manon Butler, and others, have the same responsibility that I urged on the uh, representative, the chancellor, and others from DCPS. And that is as participants in the task force and as participants in the steering committee meetings for the task force, you have a duty to be pressing for solutions to truancy more urgently you also have a duty to be pressing for solutions that will get more result, better results that will expand this program. Otherwise, there's really not much point. We're just continuing with what we did last year, maybe a little bit more improvement. We seem to be reporting better to CFSA. But in terms of the program that you're responsible for, which is the buyer model in the middle schools, we're not making any progress. If we're going to make progress, then each of the members of the task force, each of the members of the steering committee, have a duty to be more urgent 
and to be pressing for some creativity or some flexibility or some innovation or something that moves the ball quicker and farther than we have been. And let me be clear, when I say innovation or creativity, I don't mean let's do a study for another year so that we then have something a year from now. No, a conversation at a task force meeting, at a steering committee meeting, a conversation between the participants, including the CJCC, if necessary, led by the CJCC staff. That would be you. You were at the last ta steering committee meeting. That this isn't working. What are we going to do to get this working? I want you to take back to Ms. Butler. Her testimony is four-page celebrating a program that served 15 kids last year and has not expanded this year. That it's not in, until today, for the first time, that you're willing to question whether there needs to be some change to this program after a year and a half with no surprises, questioning whether this program should be mandatory. You should have done that sooner. And I want you to take back that I find it, I find it unsatisfactory that what you are conveying and what Ms. Butler conveyed in her testimony as a satisfaction with continuing with this approach toward the strategic plan. And let's be clear about this. And maybe I wasn't clear earlier. This language, everything that's on this page, this language in a different format was on the document that Manone circulated to all of the members of the CJCC at their strategic planning meeting in January of this year. Might have been in December, last, last December. So she owned it then when she circulated it to the members. The exact same language. Goal, goal, um, I've lost, misplaced goal one. Goal two, create sustainable <coughs> systems across agencies to support improved school attendance. Leverage full political and community leadership behind the efforts of the truancy task force without any timeline, without any agency being assigned for it. If we are going to have a strategic plan to reduce truancy, which would take ideas that have not been forthcoming from your office, ideas that have been kicked around in DCPS, ideas that have been kicked around by um, Ms. Donald at Child and Family Services Agency, if we're going to have a strategic plan that um, it should include those ideas, it should have timelines for those ideas. It should have measures for um, measurable goals so that we can tell whether we are achieving anything. All of that is absent from this a strategic plan. And take back to Ms. Butler that I hold the CJCC staff and her responsible for this or for the absence of that in a strategic plan. I have no further questions. Mr. Berry, Mr. Grasso. Okay. Chairman, let me ask a couple questions. Is there a tracking system to see what happened to those 15 young people that went through that process? The data committee, which is a part of the truancy task, it's a subcommittee in the truancy task force, is currently evaluating, working with DCPS to pull the numbers to find out where those kids were since this will be the year anniversary. Fifteen young people, it takes forever for somebody to track them. You know that's, that doesn't make any kind of sense, Chairman. How can you tell whether or not something is working? And I was trained as a scientist to get data and make logical conclusions. If you've got 15 young what was, the, what was the timeline they were in this program? Do you know? The uh, spring cohort? Yeah. I don't know the timeline. What do you know? I know. Tell me what you know. With regard to the truancy court diversion program? Yeah. 
I know that it has a lot of potential. I know that there are a number of students that it does not touch. I know that uh, it has had the ability to affect families. Um, and at least superficially, it has had some effect on reducing the number of absences, unexcused absences for the students who participate in the program. Fifteen students. How do you know that? Based on How that do you know it had an effect on reducing truancy among those 15? And how do you know, wait a minute, that it's helped families get a better control of their situation? How do you know all of that? The Who DC, did the evaluation? The D.C. Crime Policy Institute conducted an evaluation of the Spring Cohort, and they determined at least uh, to some measure, given the low number of participating families, that there was a positive response to the program and also that the students showed... How can you say there was a positive response to the program when it's voluntary and there were 3,000 odd students who probably should have been in some parts of it? How can you say it was a positive response? Uh, positive response on behalf of those who participated. The families who participated showed a positive response or responded positively. How do you know? Who told you that? The D.C. Crime Policy Institute conducted a study of the spring... Who paid them to do that? the Justice Grants Administration. How much do you know? I do not know the amount of the grant. Well, we're going to get our money back if that's all they did. Take 15 students, Mr. Chairman, and took three or four months to give you an analysis of what happened to those kids. Doesn't make any sense to me. I want to be supported. The Chairman wants to be supported. Members of the committee want to be supported. But well, we can't be supported of, of nonsense. It don't make any sense. Fifteen young people out of 3,000 were in this program from a, from a statistical point of view. Fifteen is less than 0.5 percent. Is that, is that count? I would rely on your math for that one. You yes. don't have to have math for that. Please don't do that. Don't be, don't be smart like that. There ain't nobody ask you about that. I don't have math for that. What kind of nonsense is that? No, I'm saying I don't. I don't know the numbers. If if you, you say know, it's fifteen, I'll agree with you. You, you testified to fifteen. I didn't. Chairman didn't. You did. And you're testifying on behalf of Miss Butler, which means you're representing that agency and the leadership of the agency, right? right? Yes, Councilman. Yeah, we well, not. You done it. And I didn't. You didn't do a good job at it in the sense of having data. This council. All of us, we may have different philosophies about this and that. One, we do like an analysis of things we paying money to get, and we paid this organization just to do 15 students, and then we can't tell what happened as a follow-up to once they were in the program, how long they were in the program, and what was the results of the program. You cannot then conclude it was successful even on a small scale. Now, if you said to me and the chairman, with 15 in the program, they were in the program for a month or two and getting themselves together, and they all attended school after that, then, then that'd be logical to make an analysis. Anyway, I, I don't want to keep this up, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I have to go out in the southeast for a number of meetings in the community. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Catania for having these hearings. Uh, they've been very uh, productive and enlightening to all of us. It's given us a chance for the public to see what a snail pace this has been. With all of the efforts, all of the meetings, all of the everything, when it's all said and done, the Chancellor testified that the referral in and of itself doesn't solve the problem. I can see if the referral led to a changing of patterns of these parents. And these students had not been demonstrated. And the, the uh, truancy levels are uh, almost flat, with the exception of, of, of two schools. The rest of the schools, some of them were above, and some were four flat, and two had reductions, uh, four had reductions, and two had uh, increases. We were given the numbers what we're talking about. And so, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. For your for your leadership, thank you for your uh, outrage uh, that uh, the public ought to know that members of this council 
are serious. Not that others are not serious, they're just moving at a snail's pace. Now with a sense of urgency, which we need. Giving the public, giving everybody confidence that we know what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Um, that uh, concludes this hearing. This has been a joint hearing of the Committee on Education, Committee of the Whole, on truancy reduction in the D.C. public school system. The record in this matter will be open until March 6, 2013. That's two weeks from today. Anybody who wishes to submit any additional comments, perhaps CJCC might wish to submit some additional explanation. The time is now 6.35 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned.